This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It's the end of winter here in the bush. The trees still are leafless. Uh, we are in search of tracks of any predators this morning, and this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Good morning everyone and welcome to Safari Live. My name is Byron and on camera with me this morning is the Prince of the Mara, Senzo. <laughs> now, um, we've just got started. It's just myself out at Juma, as you know, for the next, uh, still for the next few days. Um, now, I got an update that apparently there was a leopard uh, that drank at the Juma Passage Pride, where are the hell are you? About four o'clock this morning. I've had a look around, no signs of tracks yet, but we're going to be checking around this area very, very carefully. Maybe we have some luck today with the leopard. Now, don't forget, everyone, we are completely live, so send us your questions and your comments um, via Twitter, hashtag Safari Live is how you do it, and uh, and we'll lo we'd love to hear from you, obviously. And uh, then don't forget, we've also got our team in the Mara, they should be joining us shortly. I think this morning we've got Scott and Taylor out who are going to be joining us. So hopefully they have some luck in the Mara, I'm sure they will. Well, speaking of Scott and Taylor, let's go across to Scott now so he can say good morning to you. Hello everyone and welcome to the Masai Mara in Kenya. It is a cloudy, fairly chilly morning and my name is Scott Dyson. I'm teamed up with VM, a.k.a. the Wildebeest, and we can see Wildebeest running up on that hill. Now, we're quite far away, but I'm just going to stop and let Wildebeest do his business. What is causing these... Oh, that explains it. Hyenas are hunting. Let's try and get closer into that area. Woohoo! Now, hyenas are very proficient hunters when they want to be. So... It's important that we realize they are not just scavengers and we've yet to actually document hyenas hunting. So let's see if this morning we're going to get lucky. It certainly looked like, I think I saw two hyena there and they must be working that herd. The herd's still running. Hold on, everybody. Woohoo! These roads can be a little bit bumpy, so I've got to make sure I don't send vm flying out the side of the car he's not doesn't have much to keep him in other than holding on to his camera this is going to be absolutely awesome i just wish we could get there a little bit faster i wonder if we should shoot through here let's try it okay gotta just make sure i don't drive into a hole but thankfully the grass is not too long. Whoop. <laughs> Oof, I can see lots of hyenas. Copy that, Bex. Um, there's a chance we're going to go live on Facebook as well. Some people can't really commit to the three-hour safari, so what we try and do is also go live on Facebook when we find really exciting scenarios unfolding. That way, trying to rope people into the Safari Live family. That is our theory. Okay. 
it seems like we've caught up with the hyenas now. Let's just stop here and see what's happening. We've got quite a few here, but there are also some on the hill closer to those herds. So let me scan with my binoculars that wildebeest also get his bearings as to what's going on. Okay. So, there was just one that was, you see that one below the tree there, Vian? So it's just that one there that I can see that's close to the herd now. There may be others, but sadly it looks like the rest of this hyena's clan are heading into this forest to our right. So I think it may have just been an opportunistic kind of inquiry where these hyena thought, well, let's just kind of have one last little stab at hunting this morning. They may have been hunting all night, and a lot of the time they'll simply work the herds. Oh, good morning. Some greetings. They'll work the herds in the hope that they'll find one with a gammy leg or it's just not looking quite right. But I guess once they had worked that portion of this herd, and realize that none of them were going to be easy to take down. I think they've all given up, sadly. But what an exciting way to start the morning safari. And it's a great privilege to have you guys along for the ride. Now, Taylor is also out this morning. James is taking the morning off because he is going to be doing a session across the river. He's going to hopefully spend some time with the five musketeers, the Cheetah Coalition this afternoon, spend the night out with him. So some exciting prospects for James this evening, as well as all of you, because you'll be able to join along, and also exciting prospects right now, because you're about to jump on board with Taylor and find out what her plans are for the morning. How exciting, what a magnificent way to start the day with some hyenas running around. I wonder if it wasn't the same clan that I was following about last night. Good morning, everybody. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today, I have the pleasure of, well, joining Ma Manu. Hey, how great is that? First time, I'm now slowly just getting back into the swing of things, and we are sitting among zebra, wildebeest, and I see lots of cars up ahead, so I wonder if the Ngama Pride aren't about. Remember, this is live, this is interactive, so send through all of your questions. You can hashtag Safari Live, of course, on Twitter, or you can chat to us on the YouTube chat and ask away. But it is beautiful out here. Not much of a sunrise, unfortunately, very cloudy, but that doesn't matter. The scenery, the animals, that all makes up with it. You can't have everything all the time, I suppose. But shall we go and see what those cars are looking at? I think we should. Because there's lots and lots of things happening around you. Like I said, there's loads of zebra, loads of wildebeest. We saw some topi. So it's not too far away. But I'm, I'm slowly starting uh, to learn the roads, which is interesting. <laughs> Obviously, yesterday, if you were watching, <laughs> I went all the way to Tanzania. It was great. Didn't get a stamp on my passport, though. But, but disappointing. And um, we're just sort of exploring a different side today, sort of a more and more than we're going to have a look around here. And hopefully it is lions that's up ahead. I, I can't imagine you'd have so many cars. It's got to be something fantastic, but they're driving off, perhaps. They're not patient, and we know that patience is the best thing, especially when there's lots of animals around. I couldn't believe that hunt that James had yesterday. It happened so quickly, and, and that's what's so exciting about this, is that you just you, you don't know what's going to happen. One minute you could have a lion fast asleep, and a wildebeest herd could come too close, or a lioness might think, oh my goodness, here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it, and then off they go. Let's see, what's, have I seen something? Maybe, or have I just, yeah, good, really good at spotting termite mounds and calling them lions. Yesterday I did that about 10 times. It was great. Jandre, I think, wanted to bop me on the head. There are there lions. And looks like they might be hunting. Hang on, let me get a view. You see them there, Marnie? It's quite a far way away, but uh, there are some wildebeest just on the other side, maybe... Um, there we go. There are lions. Ears pricked, all facing forward. Those wildebeest are close. Very, very close. 
how exciting is this? Now, they've got a lot of tree cover. Let's see what they're going to do now. I'm not actually sure about all the lion prides just yet. I do see another car going around. I wonder if we can loop around on that road like they are. But let's just sit here for now. All right, I just want to say a big good morning to everybody watching Nat Geo Kids. It's great to have you on board. We're sitting with a pride of lions. I don't know how many lions are here. The grass is very long. They blend in to the vegetation, of course, uh, very nicely. But you can see there are some prey species right there. And that was another safari vehicle. I don't know if they uh, maybe had enough of the lions, but they've moved on. Their ears are pricked up. They are definitely looking hungry. That behavior is not a sleeping lion. This is going to be very, very exciting. Now, it doesn't seem like those wildebeest are even aware that those lions are there. Perhaps those lions have got the wind in their favor. And of course, look at all that thick vegetation. The wildebeest heads are down on the ground. Are we going to see a kill this morning? I think we could. And what will normally happen, what these lions will want to do, is they want the wildebeest to run around in a frenzy because panic is good for a lion, especially when you're chasing after animals. Just one mistake, and then that'll be it, of course, for the lions. I think we can go around, but it's quite a big loop, unfortunately. Maybe we, let's just hold our ground for just for the moment. There's lots of vehicles moving out in and about, and one thing we, we want to make sure that these lions have the best opportunity to catch their breakfast, that they're edging, slowly edging closer. What they might also be doing, uh, we've got to just wait and see what tactic they're going to go for. Lions are very, very intelligent, and they're very good problem solvers, and it's why they're one of the most successful cats out in Africa, because they work in a team they don't just hunt on their own they can they most certainly can do that but well two heads are better than one and it seems as though we've got three lionesses that's what i was able to make out for the moment so we just need one of those wildebeest to come a couple of meters closer towards them and perhaps they will make their move then but isn't this so exciting? Now, these are the white-bearded gnu. These are the big gnus that um, travel, well, many, many kilometers in search of new water and search of green pastures. And, the, of course, all the predators just follow them around. And there is no shortage of prey around here. They can go for zebra. There's topi, which is a type of an antelope species. Uh, it's honestly, it is absolutely endless. How exciting is this? Now, a hunt doesn't necessarily happen within a couple of seconds. Uh, here, it's a little bit easier for them, I must be honest. Down in South Africa, I think the hunting for them is slightly more difficult, and it takes a lot more planning. Like I said, if they start to scatter and stampede, one is going to make a mistake and run straight towards them, and that's exactly what they want the wildebeest to do. The lions don't want to have to run for very far. They don't have a lot of energy, of course, they have a lot of stamina. They've only got enough speed for sort of short bursts, so ideally, they want to get as close as they can to their prey for the best opportunity to catch it. They're not the greatest hunters. And it's like that with all the predators. It does take them a little bit of time. But you can see the wildebeest, the lions, they don't mind the cars moving in and out. But I think we've got a good spot here. Because I think we'll be able to see what happens from this distance. Like I said, we're a little bit far away. Sometimes it's not a bad thing to sit and watch and observe. And if they do catch us, wildebeest, we can race across and, uh, well, and hopefully get a closer view. But let's see what happens in this area. You can see there's a zebra now also coming through. A couple of zebra. Who knows? Maybe they decide not to go for a wildebeest. Maybe they decide to go for something with stripes instead. And I think the Ngama pride is quite a large pride, if I'm not mistaken. They've got a couple of cubs, so they need to catch something large. And a wildebeest and a zebra would do. A buffalo would be even better. But when there's an abundance of wildebeest like this and zebra, why go for something like a buffalo? Hello, Mike. Now, you've said this is amazing that it's happening right now. Isn't that incredible? And if you'd like to ask a question like Mike just has, please, I'd love to hear from you. You can comment away because we're in the Mara Triangle. There one lioness goes. Is it, is it or is it a youngster? They see they're running. They're not sure. I didn't see where the others went. Getting closer, waiting. See, 
Going down. Oi, will there be some jumping? No. What's going to happen now? What they can do sometimes is one will run on the left and encourage the animals to start moving, and the others could have moved off into a better position, waiting for those wildebeest. See, I can see one lion there still. Maybe that's what's happening here. I wonder if that's actually not one of the youngsters. It doesn't look particularly large. It also got a very big belly, so you can see these lions are well fed. But when there's food around, they're not going to say no. Hear the wildebeest alarming? They're telling everybody, lions, lions, everybody, careful, careful, lions. But that won't stop these lions, though. There's lots of young wildebeest in and amongst the middle. If they can't go for an adult, a young wildebeest that's not experienced might panic even more and get lost from mom's side. This is incredible. Like I said, it's live. It's happening right now. I have the privilege of sitting here with this pride of lions, all these wildebeest, and their zebra, and hopefully... We're going to see an attempted hunt here. I wonder if this is not a youngster. It's a bit difficult to see. We're so far away, and maybe it's inexperience. Uh, compelled it to jump forward too soon, and that's what happens when these lions are learning because they don't start hunting straight away. It does take them quite a bit of time, and unfortunately, younger lions can actually end up ruining it for the adults. So they've got to be very, very patient too. Well, I'm just quickly checking to see where the others are. Because that does look like a youngster. See there, that one looks slightly bigger. There's a couple of them there. This is so exciting. There's a, there's a whole lot coming. There's actually, I'm not like there's a whole bunch of lions here. Now, Lola, a question from you, wondering if lions only hunt at breakfast time. Well, Lola, any time is breakfast time, dinner or lunch for a lion. It just depends on, of course, uh, what prey is around. And and this is what's happening at the moment. It is these lions are getting in amongst the the prey species, they will sit and go, you know, during the heat of the day, they might go to sleep and relax, but they, uh, and then they'll wait for the herds to sort of forget about them and move closer. They definitely look like they want something. I think that they, unfortunately, that younger lion that we saw maybe just un messed it up. You see, yeah, that's another youngster there on the left, and that's an adult on the right. So there's quite a few juveniles. So that's the problem here. And that's the, the issue that these adults are going to face, is that you can see how excited those youngsters are. You can imagine, you know what it's like if you have a kitten at home and you dangle a piece of string in, in front of their faces, they just can't get enough of it. They can't stop swiping away. They're so excited. It's exactly the same thing with these lines. But that piece of string of course is uh, well in the form of wildebeest and zebra now you can see a lot of cars over here they're very excited people who have traveled from across the world coming to the mara triangle so we're in kenya at the moment and and that's what they're doing they're also watching this exciting uh well all this excitement unfold and like i said it might not happen right away it could take ages they could constantly get up those youngsters could keep chasing the zebra and the wildebeest around but until one of those adults make a move then we'll see. And they can run so quickly, these lions. The charging speed of a lion is 22 meters per second. That is quick. Before you blink your eye, a lion would be at your feet or at the hooves of a zebra or even the wildebeest. Isn't this so cool? Well, this is my first time in the Mara in Kenya. So this is all real new for me. I'm jumping for joy. Uh, South Africa is obviously very, very different. We don't get the large game concentrations like this. So at this time of the year when the animals are moving around, uh, constantly looking, following the reins really, it's it, it, there's just action everywhere you look. You drive, there's animals on the left, on the right. There's some wildebeest running. What's happening there? Maybe there's a lion, a young lion that's come through. They're panicking. Rishi, hello to you. Wondering if lions prefer wildebeest over zebra. Lions are not picky creatures. Uh, they will take whatever they can get. Obviously, in this area, there's an abundance of prey, uh, so they could go for anything. So even if there were a couple of Topi or Thompson's gazelle or Grant's gazelle in the mix uh, with the zebra and the wildebeest, whoever made the mistake and came too close, that's the one they're going to go for. They Also, those lions are scanning for a weak individual. For young, obviously, they'll be much easier to take down than a a healthy adult wildebeest or a zebra. 
So they're very, like I said, they're so intelligent and they're watching. And that's why hunts don't necessarily happen so quickly is because once they do a big dash, if, uh, if they run 100 meters at full tilt, they're going to be exhausted. They might not have enough stamina to make a second attempt. They might have to rest a little bit and then try again a bit later. That's also not a problem, though. Like I said, these herbivores are constantly being surrounded by predators that they sometimes they become a little bit blasé about them they put their heads down and carry on eating and completely forget that the lions about or the herds that have seen the lions move right out of the area and the next set come through you can see that lot at the back have obviously been warned that there are lions here and they're not going to come this side they're going to try and avoid the spot and that's what we look for as we're driving around and we're finding these big herds of animals. We tr we're looking in the empty spaces between the herds because that's typically where you're going to find maybe resting lions or resting cheetah. They're waiting. They're sitting. They're not ready yet. Like I said, they look well fed, so I wouldn't be surprised if they caught something last night. But it seems to be quite a big pride, and when you have got youngsters, they're constantly feeding they don't look like they'll be suckling anymore. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how old they are. They definitely look over a year. So they'll start participating in the hunts, but mostly observing. And when they get to about a year and a half, two years old, that's when they'll really be a part of the hunts. So the adults will do the hard work in terms of grabbing uh, whatever prey item they manage to get. And then you'll find the youngsters will come running in and then they'll learn the suffocating techniques. And, and they'll just sort of help hold the animal down. At the moment, they're sort of a little bit useless. And like I said, they cause problems for the adults. But... It's very, very important. They have to come in. They have to see this. Otherwise, they're never going to be able to hunt for themselves. Now, we just linked away from Taylor there. She's busy with the Facebook Live at the moment. Um, but have a look at this beautiful sunrise that we've got on Juma. Right down in South Africa. Wonderful, wonderful morning. Really very, very beautiful. Fireball in the sky. So, um, as I was saying, if there does, if there are any changes in Taylor's sighting, we'll definitely cross back to her. Um, it's amazing how quickly that sun rises. Now, I was sitting here because I actually heard what sounded like zebra alarm calls, and we're in this area, but I think possibly on Torchwood. So just to our east. I can hear a pearl spotted owl calling. That's very nice. Look at that. Great start to the morning. Peaceful. There's a few birds calling in the distance. No sign of any predators just yet. That's actually beautifully framed between those two between those two uh, marulas. Oh, one one on either side there. Or three marulas actually. Lovely frame. <laughs> bird was that that just landed there. Hold on a second, that looked like a it's an African Harrier hawk. It looks like an oh let me just see. It's quite far. I think it was a, it's um, actually just being mobbed by a 
lilac breasted roller well, I don't think we can see it now from this angle but it was a juvenile African Harrier Hawk it just flew through there now we're going to be continuing our bird quest today obviously we I'm trying to see how many birds um, I can identify and get on camera in the next week and we are sitting on 76 I think 76 I think so It is always wonderful to see the wildlife and the animals and whether they are hunting or, or interacting but it's also just wonderful to appreciate sunrises and sunsets and listen to the bush. There's so much more going on out here. And that lilac breasted roller is very unhappy. I'm trying to see if I can find that African Harrier Hawk. not sure where it has gone now but it was down there somewhere that lilac breasted roller and they're amazing very tenacious little birds or mob birds of prey try to chase them away the lilac breasted roller and the forktail drongo often mobbing birds of prey trying to chase them away Doves flying past. I haven't heard any more alarm calls from the zebra. I couldn't find the zebra actually. But it did sound like zebra alarm calls. <laughs> Some of you might be wondering what does it sound like? Uh, <laughs> I can't do the sound. <laughs> I will be mocked for days. You did it the other time. <laughs> um, no, I do, you know what, I'll... <laughs> it's still too early. Sento, <laughs> 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 shall we carry on and see what else we can find? Lovely sunrise. So nice to sit and just appreciate the beauty of Africa. Let's see what else we can find. So, Jake, you asked for an eagle. You'd like to see an eagle today? I will try my best. Try my best. Love to see a tawny eagle. I haven't seen a tawny eagle for, for quite a while. Else. Our first prize for me would be a Marshall Eagle. It's my favorite bird. Love seeing the Marshall Eagles. Michael, I think it's a great idea. We definitely will try to pop, uh, pop into the um, the hyena den at some point. I think uh, maybe we maybe oh, there's a look at that. So Jake, an eagle for you, sir. <laughs> Have a look up there. There it is, a beautiful Batelier Eagle. Now, I'm 
I'm sure this is one of the bateliers that nest in this area because we often see bateliers around here. I've seen three of them in this area, so I do think that they possibly nest around here. They're always around here. Not shaking some feathers. Oh, look at those talons. You can actually see the sharp claws and that right foot while it's perched on that branch. <coughs> oh, hang on. Look here. <laughs> look what I've just got. Look at this, everyone. That feather that that batelier shook off just floated all the way down to us there it is a batelier feather <laughs> there we go doesn't look like much just but <laughs> that is awesome it floated all the way down from there and the wind carried it straight down and just drifted to the vehicle Maybe that's good luck. Surely that's good luck. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> we'll keep our feather in the vehicle. <laughs> so, oh, Snazzy, you asked what what is the what is the smallest, most powerful bird? Um, oh, smallest, most powerful bird. Hmm, I wonder. Snazzy, I'll think about that for a while. Um, I'll try to work out what is the smallest, most powerful bird. But while I do that, let's head back to Taylor and her lionesses that might start moving, I think. Hello, everybody, again. My name is Taylor. On camera with me is Manu. I'm going to get you this lioness now. I just want to move up ahead. You see, wildebeest, lion, that wildebeest has absolutely no idea that that lion is there. But she has got a couple of obstacles in her way. She's got a massive drainage line. She's actually got to creep around the edges, following the brush line, and then she'll be able to make her sort of dash and try and catch that wildebeest. I think there are a few of them, a few wildebeest that know she's there, but she's singled out. She's found her target. See how she's moving so slowly? She's going down. Now she's going to use this drainage line to her advantage. Let's see if she's going to shoot up the other side. I think that's what's going to happen. I don't think she's going to use the brush line. I think she's going to use the drainage line. As soon as we see her dart up, if that wildebeest runs, we will quickly race forward. We want to give her the best opportunity to catch something, so we don't want to interfere. We don't want to put us between her and the wildebeest. She's got there are sub-adult lions. I'm not sure exactly how old they are, but there are quite a few of them, and they need to eat too. Let's see. There's the wildebeest. I haven't seen the lion coming up just yet. But it's quite a steep embankment, but they are very, very powerful cats. Let's, Marnie, let's, let's jump forward. Let's very quickly go forward so we can get the best possible view. There's a couple of them moving through here. There also might be a few more. Oh, there she is. No, she missed. Come on, girl, you've been trying hard. Well done, no good attempt. It's going to go right up forward. There's quite a few other vehicles around us at the moment. Good attempt by a lioness. Now, unfortunately, they're not the greatest hunters. It takes them quite a few attempts before they get it right. And I think if there was a wildebeest actually crossing in that drainage line, she would have been very lucky. But listen to the wildebeest now. That's them saying, lion, lion, lion. 
and there's a few of them around here. It's quite a large pride, and they all seem to be scattered out. I did think they ate something, though, because I saw the sub-adults a moment ago, and they had relatively large bellies, so they it could have been feeding on the remains. She's going down into the drainage line. I think what she's going to do is she's going to sneak up to them and go around. Wow, how exciting. So she's just dis uh, disappeared down there. I think... Maybe we should try and anticipate her movement now and get around and get in front of her. Let's quickly go and do that. She's going to make another tuck. Now, Dwight, you've said this is so much fun to watch. It isn't it exciting. It's live. It's happening right now. You can send through questions, comment away, and I'd love to have chats with you this morning. So how great is that? She's not using the long grass right now for her cover. She's actually moving through this entire drainage system. We're going to sit here. I think... She's going to move away from these one wildebeest on our right. She's going to try and make an attempt on some other wildebeest that don't know she's here. We should pick up on her. Let's have a look. She's keen. She's very, very, very keen. Like I said, it could take a couple of attempts before she's successful. She's not using too much energy. She hasn't done any sort of big big sprints that would, uh, would exhausting her, really. William from Kansas City, you're wondering what time it is. It's quite early in the morning. It's 25 to 8. Uh, well, C Central African time. Is it Central Africa? No, Eastern African time. <laughs> Hang on. We're going to show you where she is now. Just got to... I've just come from South Africa, so I literally arrived two days ago. My first time here. It's so exciting. We just need to wait for her to come around. It's a bit difficult. She's she's coming through this drainage line. I don't know if she's already come around the corner, but I suspect that she's coming for these wildebeest on the other side here. And that would be the most perfect, perfect sort of uh, tactic to use this morning. There isn't much wind. Lions like to use wind in their advantage. I want to be downwind of the animals constantly. But the animals around you are, are aware that there is an abundance of predators at the moment. Where have you gone, young lady? She's even given us the slip. She'll come around and she has to come around. <laughs> Kathleen, you said it looks like she's just chasing her lunch away. She's, uh, she's given it a, a go a couple of times. She'll get there, I promise you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a numbers game with lions. They have to just keep trying. And unfortunately, like I said, there were, there's a couple of sub-adult lions in this pride with them, and they messed up the first hunt a couple of minutes ago. So she's actually left these youngsters and, uh, and gone, right, I need to move away from you because you keep ruining for it. And hopefully she'll be successful this time. Now, Angie from Pennsylvania, my goodness, it's great to hear from you. You're wondering, have we ever got a kill on one of these Facebook lives? Oh, yes, so many, and not just with lions, with cheetah as well. So the possibility of uh, well, predation on prey is, is huge at the moment with the migration that's going on. There is so much food around for the leopards, for the lions, for the cheetah. We have been seeing young wildebeest carcasses scattered in a variety of trees, so there's also leopards around here. So you just never know what you're going to see. I, I don't know where she's gone now. I wonder if she hasn't maybe just had a little break. Like I said, this isn't her first attempt of a hunt so she could have actually maybe just sat down taken a breather and is going to try again in a bit now lawrence you're wondering if the wildebeest are used to our cars most certainly the wildebeest the zebra the topi all these animals are constantly seeing vehicle there are loads and loads of cars around here driving about uh, let me see. i'm just trying to see so so they don't mind us at, at all we're, we're completely neutral to them and that's what's so great about these wilderness areas is that we have been um interacting with them for such a long time for many 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 years it's we become like a rock we're not food, we're not a threat, we're completely neutral, which is really great. Okay, so I can't see her anymore, but I'm wondering, she could have already snuck ahead of us. That's also a possibility. You saw how quickly she was moving. She could have already used this drainage system and gone round. So I'm just scanning, I'm just having a look. Manu's great, Manu's a little bit higher up than I am, so he's actually standing up now, just scanning about, just seeing if we can see her. Now, obviously, we can't go down into this drainage line. It's impossible. Uh, we get stuck, and then we wouldn't be able to show you anything. So we can just stick up here and on the roads. If we don't get lucky now, what we will do is we'll turn back and we'll go back towards the rest of the pride. Like I said, it's not just one lioness here. There's a couple of them that are trying to make attempts. So very, very exciting. 
And I think I'm going to go this way. So a couple of cars coming around that you may be able to see. So everyone's come from all over the world to come on a safari. What I'm going to do is I think I'm going to turn back. I don't know where she is. There's a few people that are being patient, just like us, and, and waiting around. Oops, sorry, Manu, a bit bumpy there. But this is how it goes. It is so wild out here. You just never know what's going to happen. Wow. Jeffrey, you said you used to live in Kenya, and you're wondering if there are any male lions around. Can't believe it. Last night, I saw a male lion, actually not too far from this area. He didn't look fully grown, maybe four or five years old or so, and he was feeding off a, a wildebeest carcass that I, he either killed it earlier or we just actually saw him pick him out, pick it out of a drainage line, and he was feeding upon that. So that's another possibility. We're going to try and spend as much time with this pride of lions as possible. But if not, if we if we don't get successful here, we might go and look for that male. So I'm just having a search. I just want to sneak around these cars and I don't want to interview in their game viewing experience as well. So we'll go this way around. But she's, she's coming here. Maybe she's still sitting up ahead. She, maybe she turned around and went back herself. Again, another possibility, but we'll just keep our eyes open. Most important thing when you come on a safari is bring a pair of binoculars. They help so much with spotting game, especially in an area like this. It's open, you can see for days. Let's just have a look, maybe we can spot one of the other lionesses that were around too. There were a few around the corner. I can't see this girl. I think she's maybe taken a rest. She's um, definitely been working hard. I'm just gonna go up and around these guys. Right. So what we're gonna do now, we're going to see if we can, of course, uh, find some more of these lions. But we will be back with all of you again. And uh, hopefully, sometime today, we're going to see this pride make a kill. But for myself and Manu, it's been great. And we'll see you all soon. It sounds like there's a lot of lion activity up in the Mara again. That's exciting. Now, I saw some fresh elephant tracks. It looked like they were heading in this direction. We're going to have a look and see if we can find the Elli Ellies. That would be great. Um, and then I heard one of the other guides say he had tracks of a pride of lions um, on Juma. So we might head into that area, give them a hand, see if we can find something. Oh, there we go. There the elephant. <laughs> uh, see, I told you, saw fresh tracks. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I love it when, when I get it right sometimes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> nice herd of Ellie's. Hopefully they decide to come a bit closer. Uh, this is a nice treat. I think I'm going to spend quite a bit of time with these Ellies. They look like they're very relaxed, feeding. So maybe we're fortunate and they head a bit. Um, come a bit closer perhaps. Let's see. Rashni, you were saying the landscape is so different from the Mara to to here um, compared to here it, it, yeah definitely I mean obviously we um, we've got thick vegetation and that a lot of the the Mara is very very open so completely different um, also I mean they've got those the escarpment and that the mountains around there um, which we don't really have well not here I mean in the distance we've got the beautiful Drakensberg you actually can't see it today uh, no, can't see it. Some days are a little hazy and we don't have a clear view of them. But other days when it's very clear after a bit of rain, you can see that Drakensberg mountain range clearly. But yes, Roshni, the terrain is very different. It's 
and the best to sit with elephant and listen to them feeding and watch them move around and interact. ML, you say they're coming out to say good morning to us. It would appear so. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear this elephant moving through the grass. Oh, it's coming towards us. Beautiful female. You can see that very angular forehead, almost at a 90 degree angle, the forehead. And that's a sign that it's a female. It's an easy way to identify a female. Um, and a male. The males have rounder foreheads. Have a look at the grass on her back. She's obviously been throwing a bit of sand or something and grabbed some grass and threw that on her back too. Chitty Chatty Meg, it's not a silly question, and there's no such thing as a silly question. Um, you asked if the elephants breathe out of their trunks. Um, well, they do, they do indeed. Um, they, um, I've seen, uh, and the best, uh, uh, best um, uh, example I can give is when elephants are in the water, or they're crossing rivers or, or dams, they'll lift their trunks up um, to breathe. So you do see them. Uh, keeping their trunks above the water um, to breathe, so they definitely breathe through their trunks and their mouths, I suppose. It's a, it's a nose, that's all it is. Eduardo, I haven't. I haven't seen elef an elephant give birth. Uh, I'm assuming that would be quite a uh, quite a experience. And and Eduardo, the, the, from my understanding, the entire herd get very excited and they they're on high alert when a female is giving birth. And and sometimes they'll all come in and circle the female to protect her if she is giving birth. That's what I've heard, but I've never seen it. I haven't witnessed it. <clears throat> Quite a number of elephant. I can't see exactly how many there are. Um, Senzo, let me just move forward a little bit. I think we might have a nice view of those from this angle. that and there's a bit of better light on those <coughs> is that better yeah uh, Donna you were asking if the if I know if the elephants stand up or lie down when they give birth and if I'm not mistaken I think they stay standing Donna I do think they stay standing As I said, I'm going to sit with these elephant for a while and hang around, see what they do. But let's head back across to Taylor, who apparently still has that lioness. Hi everybody, how exciting has this morning been now? I left you a moment ago. Unfortunately, the sub-adult lions of this pride, which I presume is the Ngama pride, uh, they ruined it for <laughs> the adults, but they're going to keep going. They have got full bellies, but they've also got youngsters to feed, as we all know. And uh, they're on the move again. I think they're going to move around the area and try and follow up on the next herd. Uh, everything seems to have settled down again. The gnus aren't 
canoeing as much anymore and there's quite a bit of vegetation for them to use here. We, we've actually moved out of the golden grass. The, the wildebeest, the zebra, I presume the elephants and the buffalo, they've grazed this grass very short now. So they're going to have to use this little shrub. But we're in front of the, the pack of cars at the moment. They're all behind us. <laughs> you know how I like to be in sightings all by myself. That's also not possible here all the time. Let's see these girls again. They've dropped their heads slightly. So they're keen. They now need to just find a way in. They've still got quite a distance to go there before they're going to reach those wildebeest. But we'll stick with them. And again, if you are concerned about the vehicles being intrusive with the lions and the wildebeest, both species of animal, all the species out here, are so relaxed. Even the birds I find so much more relaxed than they are in the South African Lionic Breasted Road is sitting right next to the car and not even moving. It's amazing. So we'll keep behind them. We're not going to get in front of them. We'll let them do their thing. But unfortunately, we can't off-road in this spot, if I'm, if I'm correct. I think it's, I think we're not in an off-road area. I'm still learning all the different spots over here. But they're keen. They've left the youngsters behind now. Good job, lionesses, because they're going to just keep ruining your day, I'm afraid. And what, the third Ngama female has actually gone round to the other side as she disappeared in a drainage line, or they call them luggers here. Remember, in South Africa, we will... Anyway, we called them dongas. No, we didn't. We called them shkovanins, drainage lines. See, so they're looking. They're deciding. Maybe they're going to split up. Maybe they won't go together. See how she's creeping again, but they've got, they're far away from these wildebeest. So they're going to take their time, but because they're moving in those open gaps, they are going to sort of go down as a typical leopard crawl position so that their body is not exposed over the top of the vegetation. Otherwise, the wildebeest are going to spot them. And, well, it's very difficult when wildebeest know that a lion is there. Well, it's difficult for the lions, sorry. Let me go forward again. I wonder if this lioness is perhaps not going to stalk, 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 and then show herself. It's a technique used often by lions. And then they'll run in the opposite direction. And hopefully that second female will be waiting, laying down in the long grass. And then just jump up and grab a wildebeest that runs towards her. They've just gone together. So they're using all that, that vegetation there. Those little scrubs. Scrubs of shrubs. And just thinking what the best spot is going to be. I think let's look back. I'm just going to turn my, poke my nose like this now. It's just, it's just quite difficult to try and, and find, of course, a gap in between the trees and between the shrubs. But they're edging closer and closer towards these wildebeest. But I think because they've made so many failed attempts today, they're probably going to take their time. I think they might just take a deep breath, not race on into it. They're moving through the thicket now. Sort of, uh, you can see all the wildebeest. They don't know anything. Heads are down on the ground and grazing, as they do. Yeah, they're going to have some challenges, these lionesses. It's um, it's it's difficult here. Like I said, the grass is very, very short. Hmm. What are you going to do, girls? Ah, oh, Laura Moore, you're wondering if one of those lionesses is lactating. Most certainly. I haven't seen all the cubs yet, um, but I saw some sub-adults. I'm not sure of the ages, but to me, they look like they were about a year old, at, at least a year old. They're quite large, the ones I saw. Um, but Manu was saying to me that there were uh, a couple of, uh, there are a couple of younger ones, only a few months old. Manu, what would you like me to do? Oh, the bar. Sorry. I'm still getting used to all reverse the different things. Let me just see. I don't want this tree in the way. You know what, Manu, let me, let's go through this next gap. Let me turn around again. And so, so, Laura, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to sort of wait and see. Once I see all the cubs, then I'll be able to tell you exactly how old they are. It's gonna take me a bit of time to learn the different prides in the area. Or perhaps we've already discussed this with James. You can let me know too. Remember, hashtag Zavari Live, of course, or you can comment away on the YouTube chat. Now, I can't see the lionesses anymore. They're, they were quite far. They were almost in line with this tree. Um, hey? Do you think so? I'm just worried then we're going to be behind. We're going to be behind all the shrubs, and they're going to. Pop, they should pop out into a gap soon. It's just, like I said, it's so difficult to decide what to do. Mm. 
I know where they are. They, they're probably sitting in the grass now. They, their next gap will be an opening. And I'm quite interested to see what they're going to do there. Let's go, let's go back there. Let's go and have a look. We can maneuver around 150 times. It's not a problem. We're not between them and the animals. We're behind them. And because the wildebeest are so used to the cars moving around, same with a the lion, they're not really going to be acknowledging us. The problem comes in is when you put yourself between the animal and you need to sit quietly. We got them. Oh, there they are. Right. We will see what's going on around here and we'll get the best spot. I'm going to send you back across to South Africa with my friend Byron, who's got my favorite animal in the whole world. Oh, good luck, Taylor. I hope you get another view of that lioness. We'll see what she gets up to. Some wonderful light coming through now onto the elephant. So, Jake, you were asking what do I think is the reason behind the size of the elephant's ears? Well, Sir Jake, the, um, probably the main reason is, is for cooling. But obviously it helps uh, the hearing of the elephant. So, so from a hearing perspective, those ears uh, will, I mean with the large ears, it helps them focus or, or pick up sounds very well. But also, Sir Jake, have a look at that elephant flapping its ears. So with the African elephant, as a cooling system, they've got a lot of veins that run through those ears. So by flapping their ears, it basically cools the blood down. You can see some of those veins through there, but on the, on the inside of the ear, you see it very clearly. So by flapping their ears, they cool the blood down slightly. Not by much, but it does help regulate temperature. It takes about seven to nine minutes uh, between seven and nine minutes um, for the blood to circulate through the entire body from those years. So as I said, it does help drop the temperature, not by much, but it does help regulate temperature. So they'll stand and flap their ears. They use their ears as a sign of aggression too. They'll flap them very quickly if they are upset. They'll lift their heads up, open their ears, make themselves look bigger. All those, I suppose, are reasons or uses of the, of the ears. The big ears. <laughs> there we go. Youngster. All right. No. I think, you know what, I just got an update from one of the, one of the um, viewers from, that have been watching on the camera, on the uh, dam cam, one of the zoomies, and apparently there was a lioness that moved near Voyatella Dam. Uh, everyone, I know these elephants I think are going to hang around, we've had a lovely view of them anyway, but let's see if we can find a lioness quickly this morning. So I'm not too far, I'm on Central Road. Oh, um, don't want to rush past the elephants, don't want to startle them. Good morning. Excuse us, we're going to go look for a lion. <laughs> so that's exciting. Let's see, because I know, I heard some of the other guides say they had tracks of the lions but no one's found them yet so if we can find them there's another elephant there's a lot a lot of elephant around here this is a huge herd so um i think i'm probably going to get to that dam in the next five ten minutes five or ten minutes i think Depending what we see along the way. All right, I'm going to try get there quite quickly and uh, area and head towards Juma Dam.
Boya Taylor Dam. Let's get back to Taylor with her lioness. Hello everybody, welcome to this live broadcast. It's happening right now in Kenya in the Mara Triangle and we're sitting with a couple of lionesses and they are hungry. Look at that posture, shoulders down, head on the ground. They're finding the best way around to get to the masses of wildebeest, which you can see in the distance, all those black dots. Now she's walking right past the car. It is so close. Like I said, this is live. If you've got any questions for us, please comment away. We're gonna try and keep up with this lioness. I'm gonna have to turn around now because she's making a move again. Right. Let me just put the car into reverse. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor and on camera with me is of course is Manu. This is it's so exciting. I don't know where to park, I don't know what to do. We're gonna try and pull up as close as we can. There are lots and lots of vehicles around here unfortunately. She's sitting in the grass now. She's laying flat. She's looking for those wildebeest. It's difficult for her here. Look how quickly she's going. She, she needs to move as quick as possible when she's in these open areas. The wildebeest, the zebra, the buffalo, the elephants, the topi, all the grazers out here. That's why the grass is as short as it is. This is obviously a well-utilized area, and this lioness knows it. She knows that she has got a difficult hunt ahead of her, but they're incredible animals and she's not alone either there is another lioness uh, that was waiting in a little thicket and I think they're both trying to creep up and hopefully hopefully they're gonna work together that's what lionesses do best that's why they're so successful the lions in Africa is because they're one of the few social cats there's no other cat that's as social as a lion see how they're creeping up they're getting closer and closer very good that she's keeping that thicket between her and the wildebeest. You can see a couple of zebra also in between her. This is not their first attempt for the morning. They have many, well, they've had many, many, many attempts. But because there's so much food around, they're really lucky. They can do this over and over again. But she's not going to rush into it. She had some... Some of the younger lions in the pride to get too excited and ruin it uh, for her and the rest of the lionesses. So they've put them in the corner. They've left them behind this time round. They've been told to stay and they will stay. They'll only come once the lionesses uh, have been called back or uh, once they call the youngsters back. How cool is this? Isn't this exciting? Uh, have a look, everyone. We found this lioness. So thank you very much um, for the Zumi who let us know that they saw a lioness earlier around the dam. Now we actually, we actually quite, f uh, well I wouldn't say far maybe, mm, almost, uh, almost a kilometer from the dam. Just the one lioness dam. Just having a look, everyone. I think this this is the female lioness, the mother that has got the cubs. It looks like it. She does appear as if she is lactating. I think this is the mother. Let's just sit quietly as she walks past. Yeah, you can see some suckle marks now. I wonder where she's going. Now, I don't know if she has come from the cubs. Um, she's heading, look, she's heading in the completely opposite direction to where we had that den site last time, the, or the only time we've managed to see the cubs, but she's heading in the opposite direction. Oh, beautiful light on her, a lot of you saying she looks lovely in this morning sun. She does, she does. Well, this is a nice little treat. Oh. Elephant and lions, not a bad start to the morning. Now I wonder where the rest of the pride is. I'm just going to give her a bit of space. I'm going to give her a big, bit of space. And uh, and we can follow her and see where she goes. Thank you very much again to the zoomies that are watching on the, on the dam cam and caught a glimpse of this lioness walking on the other side of the, the dam, I think along the road apparently. We're very fortunate that we've got a few eyes and ears around and that dam cam has proved many times, uh, proved itself many times in 
terms of finding animals or letting us know about animals. There was apparently a leopard, as I mentioned earlier, that drank there about 4 o'clock this morning. But we haven't had any sign of it. And I think at 4 o'clock, about 4 o'clock in the morning, it, um, it would have moved quite far already. Now, where is this lioness going? I wonder, I wonder if she moved the den. I, I have no idea, but everyone, if she did move the den, it would be exciting because she's heading further and further into Juma. So she's currently quite basically well, in the cent central part of Juma at the moment. She's contact calling. She's contact calling. Elizabeth, you um, you were asking if this lioness is walking with a bit of a limp. Um, you're saying she's um, she's walking quite gently on the leg. I, I I didn't see Elizabeth. I'll have a look. I'll have a look. She goes, just listen, she was contact calling. So I wonder if this lioness didn't perhaps, uh, didn't perhaps go off and feed those cubs and now she's looking for the pride again. She's maybe left them already. But it would be nice if we can just stick with her, follow her, see where she goes. Chitty Chatty Meg, you asked if she breaks away from the pride with when she's uh, when she gives birth. She does indeed. Um, sorry, I'm just having a look around here. I don't want to lose her, but it is quite thick there. You know, let me. I don't want to take a chance. I'm gonna rather follow her off-road. There is a road coming up, but you never know. She could change direction. We might lose her. So I'd rather follow her through here. Um, Chitty Chitty Meg. So the lions, the lionesses do leave the pride when they are um, about to give birth. And they'll leave the pride for um, for a while while they look after those cubs. But but she will meet up with them every now and then. And uh, I mean, this lioness, I'm sure, would be happy to see the rest of the pride again. Uh, I just need to look for a little gap to get through. She's taking us through quite a thick area now. Love to see where she's going. Janine, sometimes lionesses can stay away from their cubs. Well, I suppose. Excuse me, it actually depends on how old they are. Now, this is not going to be fun, there's a buffalo thorn. Hold on, Janine. Um, Janine, they, maybe a, a day, a day and a half. But uh, they try not to stay away that long. It's probably a bit longer, to be honest, Janine. Probably a bit longer. But, um, but like I said, she would choose not to stay away that long. She would rather rather go back and feed them on a regular basis make sure they stay healthy and fed okay we still still got a nice view of her walking through the grass i'm just trying to navigate through this thick vegetation i'm hoping she takes us to the rest of the pride that would be great because 
we might be able to follow them and um, and hopefully they then decide to rest on Juma for the day and then we would have them for this afternoon too sure she's really taking us I'm glad we did decide to follow her though because this area is so thick and um, I think we'd probably lose her quite quickly where did she go now? She's still. S huh? Can you see her, Senza? Oh, there she goes. Watch out. Oh. Fighting off the branches. Watch out, Senza, there's sharp thorns there. Now, while I get through here, or try to get through here at least, I'm going to try to follow this lioness. Let's head back to Taylor, who's still got that lioness and apparently is watching Wildebeest. Watch out, Senza. Now, Janine, hello. You're wondering how long can a lioness be away from her cubs? Well, that depends. I've once seen a lioness leave her cubs for an entire week. She was trying to hunt. She was trying to find food. And there's no point going back to your cubs if you haven't got anything to give them. So they can leave them for extended periods of time. But it's, of course, it's uh, not good for those cubs because they need to eat on a regular basis, especially for the first couple of months of their life. It's important that they get enough milk. And as they start to get older, they'll be suckling as well as feeding on whatever prey items the adults manage to bring down. Now, I can't even really see where these lions are anymore, but they are there. They're definitely there. They're just trying to creep up as close as possible. Look at this. They're just going to keep... They're going to keep creeping closer and closer. These lions are determined. Now, Patricia, um, obviously we were sitting watching these uh, lions try and make a hunt. You're wondering how long can they go uh, for our, well, without fresh meat? Well, can you believe it? Lions are not picky. Out here, of course, is an abundance of food, as you can see, but they will happily scavenge on a carcass that has been there for a week, even two weeks. They don't mind. Remember, the, the digestive system of the predators is uh, a lot better than ours, of course, and they can eat putrid meat. The bacteria in their stomach helps protect them um, from any foul diseases, so they don't have to worry about that. So at the moment, of course, they'll be killing or pretty much, I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't every single day because the food is around, so it's silly not to go for it. So I would say an average lion can go, obviously the longest I've ever seen a lion not eat anything was about a week and a half and they were completely decimated. You could see every rib, every vertebrae in their body and it's tough for them. They become very weak and then hunting becomes uh, very, very difficult, even more difficult than it already is. So it's important that they constantly keep feeding, but the average is about every three to four days. Ah, there's our culprit, Reedback. I think that was the one that started, or was it an Impala? Oh, it's hard to see from here. We're so far away, I can't even see that animal with my naked eye anymore. That's how far away these animals are. There's an antelope in the grown grass, and I think that's who darted across the screen and unfortunately ruined that, that first attempt uh, for those lionesses. They're in there. Now we've got to do exactly the same thing. We've got to look for the smallest amount of movement to see where exactly these lions are, because if they went... On all fours, they get right down, haunched down. They could have creeped into a new spot because they did. I think they have moved out of the area now where we first had them. They could be already on the other side of those shrubs, but they're somewhere around here. Where are you? What are you going to do next, lions? They're so hungry and they know how important it is and they have a duty to go out and catch food and bring it back to the youngsters. The youngsters are not far from here. They're all just sitting up on termite mounds and in drainage lines, you know, keeping out of harm's way. You must remember, a young lion also could potentially be in danger with big herds like this if they stampeded. 
could easily run over those young cubs. So the predators are not necessarily the top dogs all the time. Sometimes the prey turns on them too. Where did you go? It's just unbelievable, the camouflage that they've got. And obviously it's, it can be frustrating when you lose these cats and you can't figure out whereabouts they've gone, but it's the best thing because you know that they're doing their job 150%. They're using their camouflage, they're using their stalking steels, they're getting down low and they're going to hopefully make an approach. Come on guys, you can do it. Those wildebeest are completely oblivious again that there were even lions around there. The zebra have even settled down now. Maybe they didn't see the lions. That will be very good news for those cats. I'm also just scanning around now. I'm going to look with my binoculars and have a look to see if I can't maybe see any movements in, in a different area. You notice when you first came to us, or when we first arrived with you, those lions were on the move. They're quite happy to change up their position constantly. They might not just stay in the same spot. They're very lucky to have these little shrubs around. If it wasn't for that, I think that they would have to move to a different area because the grass, I guess I was saying earlier, it's not long here. No, I can't even see them anymore. Where are you? They're obviously just playing the patience game. Uh, let me tell you, if you want to see patient animals, watch leopards and lions. It is unbelievable how they will sit for hours and hours. Or is this antelope going to walk straight in to the lions? That's another thing. They won't say no, even though it's not as big as a wildebeest and a zebra. If it walks straight towards them, they're going to take it. And I think they, it could be. It does look like a reed buck. I can't see anything just yet. That's still just the reed buck moving around. Let me scan one more time with my binoculars. Maybe they're trying to creep around, go the other side. Like I said, there's still, there's still a third lioness that's not around here. She could also be coming this way. We lost her. She went into the drainage line. She'd started making attempts of her own. She decided she'd, she'd try hunting by herself. Not necessarily the greatest technique, but it could have worked for her. Maybe once she realizes that the other two lionesses in the pride have moved off, she might go, where are they? And come start come moving this way, looking for the rest of the pride and give her a hand. <laughs> George, you've said that you were really enjoying this. Well, I am so glad. And this is what's so exciting about a safari. It's like there's so much action that happens all in one go. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, where did they go? Where are they going to pop out next? They could pop out in a completely different area. That's what I said. I mean, they could be just sneaking around in between all these shrubs. I'll tell you right now, I couldn't get as close to a zebra and a wildebeest like a lion could. They would spot me from a mile away and I make so much noise. We as humans, we're not quiet. And these cats have just worked it out. They are perfectly designed for stealth, for absolutely everything. I'm, I'm reluctant to move. I'm quite happy to hold my position where I am now. There are lots and lots of other vehicles around. Just because we know... Alright. We've managed to follow this lioness. She's now lying on a termite mound. Wonderful view of her. Uh, please excuse the links from the Mara at the moment. They, they, they're busy with a lot of Facebook Lives at the moment. So I'm trying to do as much on Facebook for Nat Geo Wild and Nat Geo um, and Safari Live. So listen, listen. So that lioness is contact calling. Sherry, you asked if the lioness would move. Hold on, listen to his contact calling. Oh, she would have stopped. Sherry, you asked would the lioness move the den? 
um, so regularly or, or stay in the same area? Well, Sherry, it depends. I th you know, w w when these cubs are born, and they'll still be far too young to really move around for the first two to three weeks, and then, um, and then she may decide to move them uh, to another den site, possibly still while they are too young to move around for themselves. Um, and then as they start getting older she will start moving a little den site probably three or four times uh, somewhere around there occasionally they might find a spot that they are happy with and they might only move once and then keep the cubs there until the cubs are old enough to then get taken And then get taken to um, just listen to a contact calling me. Charlie, you asked if a leopard can hear a lion contact calling? Definitely. Definitely. Just like we can. Let's see if she roars properly. Shame, it actually sounds like a bit of a sad call. There she comes. Is a beautiful light. We'll just sit still as she walks past us. <laughs> where did she go? She's moving there. So I wonder where the rest of the pride is. She keeps looking for them and contact calling. As I said, the other guides did have tracks of them, but I don't hear any any update that they found them. I might just radio some of the other guides and just find out if they did manage to have any luck with the rest of the pride. I don't think so. Unless they are perhaps on Biffle's Hook in the north. I'm just trying to have a look which direction she's going. Sorry. So I'm just listening to somebody. Listen to Kudu alarm calling. See the kudu that um, we passed some kudu earlier, and they've spotted uh, that lioness, and now they're alarm calling. It's amazing how alert they are. Just have a look at this, just off to our left. You can see that kudu. Let's see if we see her alarm call. You see that? There we go. Wonderful. We we often speak about the kudu alarm calls. It sounds like a bark, and you don't always see it. Sometimes it's too late by the time we get there. But this kudu is clearly alarm calling at the lioness. Oh, we're going to have to stick with her again. Um, uh, we had a question of whether or not she was. Um, contact calling the lioness was contact calling for the pride or for the cubs I think it's most likely the pride she would know exactly where she put the cubs she wouldn't need to contact call she'll only contact call when she gets into that spot that she left them but uh, Pat sorry Patricia that was your question um, so 
definitely the pride that she's looking for. It's a lot better when you're a lioness, you don't have to dodge so many trees. Funny trying to navigate through the bush like this. <laughs> Senzo is having a little chuckle behind me. I just want to see. We, um, because we're probably going to approach um, one of the other roads, yeah. Uh, Charlie, your question, sorry, and um, uh, I'm not sure if you heard earlier, um, I was saying these lions, you ask, can a leopard hear the lion contact call, and yes, definitely, and vice versa, of course they can, they can hear each other calling, most, most likely, uh, she's just decided to lie down, I don't want to, I don't want to push her too much, uh, let's see, can you see her through there, Senzo, is that okay? Yeah, let's just wait here with her. Uh, hold on a second. I just want to radio some of the other guides. Uh, Texan or or Rexon, do you copy? Uh, morning, Tex. Um, before we managed to locate on a single lioness, um, we basically between Volta's... Uh, so yeah, between um, Nyala Road South and Vultures Nest Road, um, we're south of Central. Just a single line there. She is contact calling. Did you have any luck with the Pride this morning? The tracks. Okay, copy. Uh, she's contact calling and moving. I'm going to stick with her. Maybe she takes us to the Pride. I'll keep you updated. No, it doesn't sound like anyone else had luck for the Lions this morning just us <laughs> team effort zoomies and us now usually the lions are very very good at pinpointing where each other are. Stanley, 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 as I mentioned, um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the, li the lion cubs can go a few days without food, but ideally the lioness will return every day and feed them. So, yes, but like I said, this lioness may, may very possibly have left those cubs early this morning, so they've fed, they will rest now for, for quite a in quite some time until she finds the pride maybe the pride are hunting again um, you know she also needs to eat easy if she's got a pride to help her catch food yeah now that's linked to Patricia's question of how long can she go without food 
Um, or Patricia, she's she's feeding cubs, so she'd have to try and feed every two or three days, and depending on how much food she gets. Listen, listen. That sound, even though, it's quite a, even though it's quite a low sound, will definitely be picked up by the rest of the pride. But I wonder if these lions are in this area. I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. We are going to stick with this lioness for a while. Hopefully she finds the pride. But Scott has got a male lion in the Mara. Let's go and have a look. Hello everyone. We have found not one, but two young male lions. And we're just giving them some time to see what they get up to. They could well be spending the rest of the day here. And there doesn't seem to be much prey in the area, sadly. They are quite hungry. And that's probably attributed to the fact that they are still learning the ropes of hunting. And like I said, there is not much prey in the area. Most of the herds are further north of where we are. We're on our way to a few more herds to kind of the south of where we are. So these guys are in the middle of where most of the wildebeest are on this side of the Mara. The one that's standing up is slightly bigger than the one who's lying down now. So maybe they're not brothers. Maybe they are cousins from the same pride born at a similar time. And they have come of the age where they need to start fending for themselves and start looking for a territory of their own. Possibly, I mean, you may find that they are still trying to touch base with mom or their mothers and aunts as much as they can in order to try and cash in on some easy meals. So no different to young children who are leaving home at around 18 who enjoy getting mom's home-cooked food from time to time. Now, let me just move forward a little bit. I have noticed some potential prey skipping through the plains to the left of them where they're looking in the direction they're looking. But sadly, the lions don't seem to be doing anything. So there go all the topi. And as you can see, nice long grass, it would have been a great spot to be able to lay an ambush. But it appears like these guys have possibly had a long night as it stands and are not interested in taking a stab at those topi. They're definitely looking in that direction, but I think they've missed the boat. Sounds like you guys have had an ex exciting morning. Taylor's had lots of good lion action on the hunt. Not too sure what Byron's been up to. I'm guessing still working on his bird list. And I wish him luck in getting to triple digits. <laughs> Hello, Saha. You'd like to know if all lions have got a similar coat coloration and pattern. And as a general rule, yes. I mean, most lions do look very similar. You do occasionally get a slightly pale version or a slightly darker version. Um, with the males, there's definitely a distinctive difference in their mane color. So when these guys grow up, one may have a dark mane and one may have a blonde mane. So mane coloration does vary, but the general body color is pretty much standard, unless, of course, you are lucky enough to see 
a very rare gene of lions, a recessive gene that causes them to be leucistic or white. And there's some of those in South Africa at the moment, some in the Timbavati, which is adjacent to the Kruger National Park and open to it, just north of the Sabi Sands where Byron is. And also on a very similar latitude further east into the Kruger National Park, there are, I think there's one male, possibly two white males in a pride in an area around a concession called the Nwanetsi Concession. So there are a few white lion living in the wild at the moment, but there are very few of them. So that would be an example of a drastically different colored coat. Okay, well, I think that these guys are not going to be up to much more, or much at all. So we're going to take a gamble and go and look for some more active lions possibly closer to some more of the migratory herds as we would like to try and find you guys some action as opposed to just sit with sleeping lions. Very good. Ah, well, thankfully while we go and look for a lioness, you won't have to go too far because Byron's got one with him right now. still sitting with this lioness and thank you Scott and it would be great to get to triple digits with the bird count I don't know though if we're gonna be lucky to get that high but you never know I'd like to get to over 80 this morning need four more to get over 80 That line is calling. It's not a full roar at all. There's just a contact call. Sounds sad. Sounds sad. <laughs> Senza says it sounds a bit sad, like she's looking for the for the pride. So I'm just listening to the radio quickly. Janine, I, I don't know how far these um, calls can be heard from. I'm not sure how sensitive the, uh, the lion's hearing is when it comes to these con contact calls. So I actually, I, I don't know Janine, I've got no idea. Obviously a full roar will be heard much further away, but I don't know, she's not interested in in calling and I can't hear anything being returned, I can't hear another lion calling back So just uh, what you were saying, I can't hear anything being returned, but, and Anna Marie, you were asking if they would contact call back, indeed. They would, they would, definitely. Um, or they would possibly come and look for her and head in, 
in this direction. It's starting to warm up quite nicely. We're sitting in the sun here. And um, so, Senzo, you might just have to tap me on the shoulder in case I doze off every now and then. <laughs> it's so pleasant. It's really, really nice. <laughs> Apparently, it's 19 degrees Celsius and about 66 Fahrenheit. Again, Megan, I think that is wrong. <laughs> I laugh so much at this. <laughs> I laugh so much at this weather station that we get out of Portsmouth. I think it's so off. It feels a, a bit warmer than that. And other times when it's really cold and it tells us that it's warmer, I, I don't know. Maybe my, my internal thermostat is broken, perhaps. this lioness has luck in finding the pride um, it's funny part of me part of me wishes that she finds the pride and um, and then there's a part of me that wishes we were heading in the other direction towards the cubs that would have been a really nice surprise for this morning but um, Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's so, so lovely to see a lioness, follow her around. See now this, I mean, it could change. Uh, she, she could continue moving around. She could go and, and try and find the pride. She's been contact calling, no luck just yet. She could also stay, rest, and starting to warm up, as I said. So she might rest a bit and maybe move around a bit later. Or wait for the pride to call, possibly. Um, and I don't know. Don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Telly, you said, "What is that whining sound? And could it be my my tummy <laughs> wanting coffee?" Well, I am getting hungry. That's what you know. I'm. I'm hungry a lot. Everyone, it's a it's a problem. I, I do get quite hungry from time to time and I suffer from hangry I get quite grumpy when I'm hungry <laughs> but um, I think that sound that you heard was the lioness it wasn't my belly I'm trying to while I'm sitting here I'm still scanning around for some birds that we haven't got on our list yet I'm still sitting on 76 I can hear a orange breasted bushrike and I've heard the orange breasted bushrike a number of times but unfortunately we just can't find it I'm going to reposition quickly you can stay with us I'll just try to get to the other side. Also, I think if I reposition, it'll help me so that I don't doze off. <laughs> Turned out to be a lovely morning. Elephant, lions. The kudu. Oh, kudu. We, um, the, the, the lone ranger of Juma at the moment, <laughs> everyone else is either on leave or in the Mara. Oh, so Byron, the lone ranger of Juma. Might stick, what do you think, Senzo? We've at least got 
another cameraman. <laughs> Soon too. And tomorrow's. But weren't you just on leave? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. The worst thing for somebody who works in the bush, the worst thing you can say to them when they say they are going on leave, and you say, but weren't you just on leave? Oh, they get very grumpy at the end of six weeks or depending on the cycles that they work. Yeah, it's a bit different. I think it's a mix and match. It's sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. But generally within the lodges, it's a six-week period on, and that's every day. Just remember, you don't get weekends or public holidays out in the bush, um, and then they have two weeks off. So by the end of six weeks, people are ready to go away, and, and they're ready for a break. So you can say to them, but won't you just on leave? Gets them every time. <laughs> I do enjoy winding people up. Believe it or not. I'm just listening to the radio again. And ben, this lioness is in good condition. And um, she got to feed the other day. On, uh, quite a bit of buffalo meat. So she's, she's fed recently. But... Um, that was, last time she fed was two days ago, so so pretty soon she'd start looking for f some food again. She, she doesn't want to leave it too long. Some quillias flying past. We've seen them. Sure, there really are no birds close by. Oh, and we almost had a long billed crombeck yesterday. It disappeared a little bit too quickly for us. We didn't get it, no, Senza, we didn't. We need that, we need a heron. Ah, now Steph is also joining us this morning. And Steph, I think, is sitting in the control room. And he's, I think, busy playing with the river cams and probably got some nice views. Let's go and have a look. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to these uh, river cameras that we have on the Mara River here in Kenya. My name is Steph Winterpool, and have a look at this fantastic animal behavior that we have. Those are obviously hippo, and in the water is a dead wildebeest. Now, these wildebeest die during the migration, crossing the river, either through drowning or just through crocodile kills. And... It's not an uncommon thing to read about or hear about hippo eating off of carcasses, but it's a very rarely filmed or documented occurrence. And I'm hoping that this hippo starts to actually feed on this carcass. Right now, it's just showing a lot of interest in it. And because hippo are such gregarious animals, any interest that they show quite often attracts the interest of others. And you can definitely see that this hippo is taking more than just a cursory investigation at this, uh, at this carcass. It's difficult to say whether or not the carcass is, is open. And I'm wondering if we are going to see these hippo actually open the carcass. As far as I'm aware, this is quite rare behavior. It's not stuff that you see Often you can see that that mouth opening display that that hippo is doing, it's not a laugh or a smile. That's actually that hippo's agitation showing through. I can't imagine that something dead and smelly for a herbivore is anything but a little bit, um, I suppose, it, 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 it'll generate some anxiety in an animal. It's not a scavenger. They don't get excited by it. Just have a look now. For those of you who didn't know, hippo are herbivores. They eat mostly grass with a few water weeds and mostly coarse grass as well. Very good at digesting grass, but for many years it's been recorded that hippo will 
feed off of carcasses. They will feed on carrion. And at times we've actually seen hippo coming to almost, it looks like they're coming into rescue wildebeest and topi and zebra from the mouths of crocodiles. I just think it's them reacting to the excitement of the, uh, of the moment. But this, is def this, this carcass has been here since yesterday. And this young hippo, that's the one on the left-hand side, has now been joined by a slightly older hippo, the one on the right-hand side. And I'm wondering if they are going to try and feed on this carcass. And going around to the other side. It's been uh, and chewing on the horn there. It is just such weird behavior. Myself and James were going through a couple of scientific papers of hippo the other day and one of the papers that we read was actually about hippos eating meat and it went into a lot of detail about uh, what type of digestion they got but the gist of it from what I could gather at least anyway is that most herbivores retain the ability to digest some meat and it is a residual of of uh, being able to digest milk when we are babies. So it doesn't matter how much of a herbivore you are, basically, as far as I can gather, at least anyway, we do retain, or herbivores do retain some ability to digest meat and augment their diet into adulthood. And that is what we're seeing here. Well, that's what they think, at least anyway. Ah, Faisal, you just asked if the hippos would feed on the meat or whether they actually feed on the tummy contents, the, what, the, what the animal's been eating. That is a very, very good question, Faisal. I would, from the study that James and I were reading, they feed on the meat. But what could be the draw card is the fact that these wildebeest have got a lot of fresh grass in their, in their rumen, and perhaps the smell to a hippo is irresistible, and that's what draws them in. Um, it's tough to say, Faisal, you know, even in the, 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 the papers that we, or the paper that we were reading, it, it said that this behavior was, was recorded, observed, but never witnessed by anyone that was doing the study. And this is the first time I've ever seen this particular action with my own eyes. You can see that hippo there. Definitely haven't got the right teeth for breaking open a carcass. Um, hippos have got these pig-like incisors in their bottom jaws and in their top jaws and then they've got these massively enlarged canines all with slicing parts but not designed to slice open carcasses they'd almost have to wait for crocodiles or the carcass to become so rotten i think that it would break open on its own accord however i don't know how this wildebeest died and i don't know what type of injuries it has uh, under the surface there you can see the younger hippo now on the left-hand side making space for the slightly bigger, older hippo on the right. Still not moving off of the carcass and generating a lot of interest from hippos further downstream, as you can see the ones moving in. You know, right now they're not feeding on the carcass. But that definitely doesn't look like they want to have a game of catch with this wildebeest, that's for sure. You can see that one on the right hand side got his jaw right over the leg. Isn't this just the most amazing thing? Don't forget this is interactive. Please feel free to ask me questions on Twitter. This for me is about as new as it is for you to be quite honest with it. I, I, the only reason why I know a little bit more about this than you do at the moment is that I was very kindly sent a paper on hippos. And one of the papers that we were sent dealt with, uh, with hippo apparently eating meat and it was just such an interesting topic that we we were reading it to each other here the other day now look at what they're doing licking it with that massive tongue isn't this the most weird thing obviously hippo use their lips to crop grass and so their lips are actually quite strong they'll use their tongue then to to pull the grass into their mouth underneath their rows of molars they've got a very well developed set of molars that is that starts in the back end of their mouth basically where their their, their mouth upturns that's where the hippos molars starts and extends to just below and perhaps a little bit be, uh, behind their ears so a very long molar set 
many molars. I don't exactly know what the dental structure of. There we go. Look at those. You can see those peg-like teeth at the bottom with those enormous incisors. Or canines, at least, anyway. Used only for defense. They don't eat with those teeth at all. Those are just to protect each other. Well, actually, to fight amongst one another. There's another one. Look how wide my mouth is. Look how big my teeth are. That's basically what message that is sent. I've got a bigger mouth than you. I've got bigger teeth than you. Please leave me alone. That is, that is all that that message says. It's a threat display more than anything else. And you probably find that these hippo are getting a little bit territorial over this carcass and that the bigger hippo wants to dominate this opportunity to get some food. Now, Perry, you just asked if, uh, if these hippo are trying to puzzle out how to get this carcass out of their territory. And that's also an interesting observation there, uh, Perry. I mean, I've obviously drawn my conclusion from the fact that um, I arrived, you know, probably prejudiced to the fact that I'm wanting to see hippo eating on a carcass. And I'm now seeing, seeing hippo mouthing a dead wildebeest and thinking to myself, ah, it must be the fact that they want to eat some of this thing. When it could very well be something else entirely and it's not out of the realms of possibility that they are trying to unbeach this carcass or at least trying to perhaps not in a perhaps not thinking of it exactly like that but perhaps trying to move this carcass further downstream or into the main flow of the river so right now inconclusive there Perry I you know your your observation is probably as good as mine at this point I have no I have no other clues to give to be honest Cola, you've made the comment that it, you know, or asked the question, could it be that they're contaminating the water? I, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean by contaminating the water. Is it the hippo trying to contaminate the water, or are they trying to, trying to get, get rid of this uh, putrid carcass that's contaminating their pools? Um, I'll answer both questions, if I can, with the same answer. Hippo, are, they are able to really deal with the most horrifying water conditions that you've ever imagined in your life. Massive amounts of nitrates in the water, phase hippo hardly at all. And I can imagine that this flowing river is taking whatever, you know, whatever rancid stuff is coming out of that wildebeest and is pushing it downstream. And I don't think that where these hippo live in this pool, it's having much of effect at all. So I don't think so. I don't think it's because they're wanting to move uh, uh, this carcass out of the way because it's making their swimming pool dirty. Um, I would imagine that it's just an investigation. That said, you know, hippo are very, very curious about things uh, outside of the water and anything new. They will quite often come and inspect things uh, quite, quite closely. Um, mainly, do you, mainly these dung posts that they have uh, adjacent to their paths that they walk. Hippo do not have any glands on their skin, any sebaceous glands or any, any glands of any sort that allow them to uh, leave a marker on, in their territory or where they're walking around. They only use dung. And for that reason, hippo are very curious about dung posts uh, that they spray. You can see this hippo center in the center just starting to flap its tail and deposit some dung. Now they'll do that the older the hippo, the more they'll do this on bushes and things like that. And, and almost every hippo that walks down that path will stop and actually investigate those posts quite intimately. And I, I think that it is, is, I think that it, it's their natural curiosity for something that's different that possibly led to this investigation of this carcass. You can see this one has now moved off completely. A day or two from now, if the water level doesn't rise and this carcass doesn't unbeach itself, the crocodiles will start to, um, start to tear into this carcass, I think. Might, might even see it today. But anyway, it looks like this uh, hippo has now moved off and it doesn't look like we're going to get any feeding on this carcass off at this time at least anyway. We're going to be manning these cameras obviously for the rest of the day and so if anything happens that is exciting we'll let you know either through the show or after the show through a Facebook live notification. Anyway we're going to send you off to Taylor who's sitting with some buffalo. Now a big thing that we've been waiting for 
at Juma is, of course, the return of the buffalo. And Byron, a couple of days ago, got the largest herd we've seen in ages. But, Byron, I'm sorry to say that there are bigger herds of buffalo here, too. It's unbelievable the amount of animals that are here. And I'm very excited because, of course, there's even a couple of yellow-billed oxpeckers that are right, uh, jumping from buffalo to buffalo. We have to wait for that. Oh, I can just see it peeking over uh, sort of where its wither would be. There it is. How great is that? Now, because the buffalo hadn't returned at Juma, oh, we've obviously been waiting and very patiently for them to come back. Uh, and this was one of the exciting birds that we would have had an opportunity to see. They always hang around at the ends of the herds, but they're all around here. It's so cool. It's so nice to see them. I feel like even the buffalo are bigger here. <laughs> really, everything is just so much larger. And a lovely herd. Uh, there's probably about 40 of them or so. They're quite spread out now, but they've bulked up um, just in this little area over here, grazing around, also scanning, keeping an eye out for for lions. They don't want to be eaten too, but the lions seem to be preoccupied with other things. They're also, the pride lions that we had have now gone to sleep, fast asleep, so we will follow up on them a little bit later they weren't successful in any of the attempts that they made but that means this evening they're only going to be more excited there's a juvenile too now it's quite easy to tell the difference between a red-billed oxpecker and a yellow-billed oxpecker firstly the beak of the yellow-billed oxpecker in my opinion is a lot more robust also a, a larger yellow base and they lack the yellow orbital ring that they have around their eye and of course you can see it's a juvenile because it's very playing in color not even its eye has turned red just yet and they also feed on different types of ticks compared to the red-billed oxpeckers they're going for more of the uh, large engorge, engorge ticks. That's what they prefer. But how nice is that? I love it. I'm so happy to see buffalo. It's so... I can't tell you how amazing it is out here. Literally around every single corner there's animals. But let me tell you, you can definitely drive for half an hour and there'll be nothing on the open plains. We're just very lucky. We're not even far from camp. We're right down just below Ngama Mara. Can you believe it? And all of these animals around here, the lions are there, the buffalo are there, the wildebeest, the zebras, birds, you name it. It is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful spot. There's a couple of wildebeest too and a few more buffalo here and there. How awesome is that? So they're still coming around this side. But they'll graze this area down short as well. They, they seem to be working on it at the moment. It's still quite long. But once the, again, buffalo are really good at turning tall grasslands into shorter grasslands. Isn't that nice? So there we go, Byron. Not only are you doing birding in Juma, I'm finally having the opportunity to do a little bit my side. Seen some interesting birds. I haven't even had a chance just yet to go through them. But I suspect when we do find a pride this afternoon, a pride of lions, and we settle with them, if they're not getting up to too much, I will be pulling out my bird book and going through it and trying to figure out who on earth I've been seeing as we are driving around. But it could be quite exciting a little bit later today with the Ngama Pride. Um, so, like Steph was saying, if there is any action, of course, keep an eye out on Facebook uh, because we definitely will be going live with those broadcasts throughout the day. But there's just animals everywhere. Every little black speck that you see on screen is an animal. Now, Shamsun, you say that the, not the red-billed oxpecker, the yellow-billed oxpecker, that's what this one is. There's number 79 on your bird list, your Mara bird list. Wow, goodness, Brent, 71, not even, not even 79, 71, sorry about that. Um, so that's very exciting, that's great to know. I don't even know what birds I've seen just yet in Mara, so I'm so behind, but I will get going. I couldn't even count how many birds I've seen in South Africa, can you believe it? But moving on we're going to move from these uh, buffalo now we're going to head and try and find a male lion that was we saw last night i'm going to send you across to byron and he's one step ahead of us he's got a lioness now we're still sitting with this lioness but i think i'm going to leave her now she's been lying in this position for the past 10 or 15 minutes very comfortable she's still contact calling now and then trying to hear and find if she can get any call back from the pride
So I'm hoping she does decide. Or she does find, find the lions. I think we are going to leave this lioness now, so maybe give her some time to try to find the pride. Hopefully she has some luck. I don't know if she's just going to rest here um, or maybe decide to move around again later once we've left. But we've spent a fair amount of time with her and lovely seeing her. And hopefully she does find the pride and maybe they've got something to eat for her. If we drive around, maybe we get some signs of them in this area. So we'll have a look. This morning, maybe this afternoon, we'll come back and have a good look around. Because she must know something that we don't. That these lions must be in this area somewhere. Get another branch sensor. Oh, it sounds like Scott has a mongoose in the Mara, and, and that is interesting to see. So let's go across to Scott now and find out what species it is. Hello, everyone, and we have. Uh, wonderful little family or quite large family actually of banded mongoose I've usually counted between kind of 20 and 30 in each of the family groups that we've seen interestingly as we arrived on the scene we kind of got the impression that they could have been scavenging some titbits off this old rancid gnu carcass I think there are still one or two just close to the carcass there, but they may be just, but oof, it stinks. The wind is blowing straight towards us now and getting some very pungent, unpleasant aromas from that carcass. What's interesting is that they're not the only interesting or abnormal animals we've seen snacking on carcasses this morning. Some of you guys have seen the hippo nibbling on the carcass in the Mara River, which is not too far from here, I believe. With Steph, there's a sacred ibis. He's also lurking around these guys. Both quite interesting species to see around a carcass. Wonderful. Another interesting thing about the carcasses, some of them that you see strewn across these plains, is that they're still fairly intact. So we can be certain that large scavengers have hardly fed on this. So this may have died of natural causes. Had lions or hyenas fed on this, you would have seen very little skin, and it would just be bones that remain. But I'm guessing it's mainly vultures that have fed on this one. And there's just such a surplus of food for the scavengers that not all of the carcasses will be torn apart as they ordinarily would be if there was less food around. And off they go. I'm surprised they don't get aerial attacks from predators more. Possibly they do. Um, it would be something very interesting to see. It's something we've battled to document as predatory birds hunting. And that's obviously because we battle to stay with them as we cannot fly like they can. But it is something that I foresee us possibly being able to document in the coming weeks and months because when these mongooses run through the open clearings as they are now, They've got very little cover or escape routes, so large predatory birds like martial eagles, I'm sure from time to time, will snack on them. So we're going to start working our way back up the Mara River in an area that we have not yet 
traverse this morning in the hope that we find some action along there. Usually it is quite productive with predators along the river. But we thought we'd start off in the less busy areas where we can off-road to see if we get any luck there. And seeing as though we haven't had much luck in those areas, we thought we'd go to the slightly busier areas where some other vehicles may have already found some animals which will make our lives easier in finding them too. Okay, we are going to be sending you now back to one of the river cams. However, it will no longer be Steph narrating. It will be Mr. James Henry. Hello, everybody. Yes, I've managed to pull myself out of my bed. You know, very brave of me it was. And here we find, well, the same hippo that you were watching with Steph earlier. But interestingly, they are lurking about not at their carcass anymore. There's their carcass, the one that they were chewing on. They're lurking about with some crocodiles, and an uneasy peace has developed here. And I think that's for a number of reasons. I'm sure that crocodile's hanging around to try and see if he can have a go at that carcass. And the other reason is that these are quite small crocodiles, and I wonder if that doesn't have something to do with the easiness with which the relationship is currently progressing between the hippopotamus and the reptiles all of whom look like they are really quite over life at the moment. They're just kind of standing there looking a bit morose. And that could be on account of the weather. Uh, you know how the weather affects your state of mind. Uh, it just tends to make me feel a bit miserable when it's like this, and I think the hippo are the same. Um, and you say, what would the hippo be missing from their diet if they're eating meat? And not necessarily anything. So what I mean by that is hippo are well documented for eating carcasses. It's not unusual to see them doing it. It's just quite interesting to see them doing it. And we don't see it often uh, at Juma, for example, because we don't have hippo in and amongst carcasses as often as we do here. But it really isn't that unusual. So their diet does consist of carrion from time to time. And therefore, their diet is not necessarily lacking in anything. What nutrients do they get from the carcasses. I'm just watching that one yawn there. Um, well, there would be some extra protein, I suppose. There might be some fat. Uh, I just probably largely, uh, it's probably a bit of both that they need. There won't be too much fat on a sort of um, savanna ungulate. They don't tend to produce a lot of fat. But the, the amount of protein that is available from grass, especially during dry times, is limited. And it's not a very dry time at the moment, but there is a protein source that is sitting there. Other than that, uh, from the bones, I guess they're sucking the bones. They might get a bit of phosphorus and calcium in the same way that uh, giraffe do. But it's not unusual to find any herbivores sucking on bones or even eating stones or, you know, licking sand every so often. We've seen Nyala doing it. We've seen Nyala eating uh, or sucking on the bones of giraffe. We've seen Nyala uh, sucking on the shells of tortoises uh, quite often at Juma. And we've definitely seen giraffe often mangling. Well, not mangling, but they sort of suck and then chew and then suck and then chew uh, on the bones of various carcasses. So it's not unusual for herbivores to sample animal products from time to time. LMI, you say, is the, croc is the carcass worth eating even if the crocodiles won't defend it? I'm not really sure what your question means. Uh, I, you know, what's going on here is that there is so much food in the river that the crocodiles uh, are quite full. They're also, it's quite chilly outside, so they're going to struggle to move around because they're reptiles. The hippos, of course, rather like you and I, are warm-blooded, which means that they can move around. It doesn't matter how cold it is. Um, and so I think you'll find that the lack of crocodile activity on that particular carcass is a combination of both things. But there are carcasses strewn about this river absolutely from top, at least from source to uh, basically from source to where it, it ends, mouth, and I guess that's what I'm going for, uh, source to mouth. And, you know, there'll be crocodiles eating those things the whole way along. Chuck, you say it's nice to see hippos out the water. It is quite fun, isn't it? 
It's much, much more fun to see them sitting out of the water where they are now rather than happening upon them in the bush while you're on a walk. That I find to be one of the most terrifying things because you know that they don't like seeing people on foot and so very, very careful, especially on a day like this. If you're taking a walk with guests, you've got to be super careful on a day like today because you could easily find hippos still grazing coming back from a night out. See the oxpeckers enjoying some time on the hippo? But you see how they're just standing there, kind of resting their mouths on the sand and looking a bit confused and dazed by life. Let's go out a bit. Oh, no. Shamsan, you say one of the hippos looks very pregnant. I can't tell if a hippopotamus looks pregnant or not. They all look pregnant to me, including the bulls. So... I really couldn't tell. Maybe you're talking about this one. And you say, what is the gestation period? The gestation period of a hippo is unusually short for an animal this size. It's about eight months. That's less than a human being. And yet they weigh two and a half tons for some of them. You know, this female does look like she could be pregnant. I mean, I say that. I don't, I don't know that for sure. She's just got a very fat, round belly, doesn't she? Except I'm not sure that that's a female. <laughs> Let's hope for some tail movement here. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit anatomical as I zoom in to see what I can see here. I think that's a bull. I don't think that's a cow. Right, so from one pregnant hippo bull, we're going to go across to Byron, who's had a particularly poor birding morning. He's only on added one. No, he hasn't added any from yesterday. Let's go over to him. Not just yet, not just yet, but I'm hoping to add some shortly. Let's have a look around here. Oxpecker, that doesn't count. We've seen oxpeckers. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm just scanning around this waterhole. In the trees yesterday, there were a lot of birds around here. Let's have a look. Snazzy, now I was thinking, I, I, it's all relative. I don't know about the, the smallest, most powerful bird. I, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, is it one of the falcons, maybe? Possibly one of the falcons. Um, is it one of the, the owls? Uh, yeah, Tally, you you said you think maybe a peregrine falcon. Yeah, possibly, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Snazzy, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, how do you measure it? How do you? Yeah, I'm not sure. You've stumped me on that one. <laughs> I'm just going to scan these trees quickly. See, maybe we can get a chin spot batis or something bouncing around these trees. There's a bit of a breeze blowing at the moment, and I see absolutely no birds. <laughs> LMI, uh, you asked, what is the largest number of owls? that I've spotted in a single drive. I'm trying to think. I think it's three or four. Uh, I think that's it, three or four. Which is still cool. Um, I think uh, I think the amount of different different ones, though, it's probably th three. I think giant eagle owl, pearl spotted owl, and wood, um, not wood owl, the uh, barred owlet, I think those three. I think it's three different species in one drive. It sounded like a small little bird flying around. See, now I've got to start looking for these really small little birds, the ones that are not easy to find. Um, let's see if we can't get a, I don't know, something. Now, Rick, you asked if we get peregr peregrine falcons here. 
Now, I've never seen in the sands. Um, I'm just trying to look for their distribution. I've never seen here, though. say they come through they come through from time to time but I've never I've never seen it yeah I'm trying to think I've never I don't think I've seen a, a peregrine falcon in in southern Africa and um, just it's luck of it it's funny sometimes that these birds they're just certain birds that you you just haven't seen yet which is good so I'm hoping to to spot one at some point but I've seen some of the other falcons the um, Emma falcon uh, the uh, Lana uh, you know the Lana falcon I've seen I saw those in the Kalahari those were nice um, pygmy falcon that's probably a bird it's snazzy that I suppose a falcon and that the smallest and most powerful pygmy falcon let me show you a picture of one quickly uh, that little bird over there. Can you see that, Senzo? Is that okay? Here we go. That's a little pygmy falcon. Beautiful little bird. But you mainly get up in the desert areas, drier areas. Now that is probably one of the more powerful tiny birds. It's small. It's small, very, very small little pygmy falcon. 20 centimeters tall, not large at all. Um, what else have I, what other falcons have I seen? Um, red-necked falcon I also saw in the, in the Kalahari. Um, so those, those birds are always nice to see. All right, well, we're going to continue our search for birds. And our friend Scott... He's still in the Mara with that beautiful male lion that he found earlier. Hello everyone. And from one lioness in South Africa to another. Good timing as Byron, I'm told, has just left that one. This lioness does have another one of her pride members nearby and she is heading straight towards some buffalo now i find it highly highly improbable that she's going to try and attack them if anything if they catch wind of her they may chase her which will be quite humorous always interesting to see the hunter becoming the hunted and byron Obviously just misheard, he thought we had a male lion, we don't, we've got two lioness, one of which is kind of further to the left of where this one is, at least that's where we last saw her, and again I just find it, oh, the first buffalo seen her, if you just zoom out a bit, there's a buffalo approaching her, look at that, isn't that fascinating, and it could well chase her, here it goes. I'm not sure if you can hear the tourists cheering for joy behind me. It's quite funny. <laughs> they were quite happy that the buffalo chased that lioness away. And it's simply too dangerous, too large a prey for two ladies to be taking down, unless, of course, they were desperate. These big buffalo bulls. Oh, here comes another buffalo bull coming charging in. <laughs> and... I'm sure this lioness is just going to try and create as much space between herself and them as possible. And she's probably heading up into the little rocky outcrops and thickets that you can see in the distance there. They often like to sleep out there during the day, I'm told. VM spent quite a bit of time in this area with these lion. He says there's often a third lioness. So we're not sure where she could be. As I said, we've only seen two. And also Scar. A very well-known big male lion offer also often lingers in this area. It's the only kind of area that I've seen him in. Ooh. Let's just get one or two more views, see what she's going to end up doing. We've just come from that direction, and there's sadly no smaller bite-sized snacks for her. So not too much in the way of any possible food that we saw. Of course, there could have been something hiding behind a bush that I haven't noticed. 
Actually, speaking of which, I think there is an impala up on that ridge there. Let me just reverse a little bit. Just to the left of the tree, Vim, I can see something kind of orange colored. Oh, looks like the lioness got chased again. We're clearly a little bit lower than where she is, so we can't see her. That was an impala though, Vim. No, it's still a Oh. Hello, Dory, you'd like to know if I think this lioness has cubs in the area. Um, she could, but I am not aware of the lioness here having any cubs. And I certainly didn't see any distinctive baggy mammary glands dangling below her belly and or suckle marks. So I do not think so. Let's try and sneak forward, get a few more views. So what I thought was an impala was a termite mound. And as predicted, she is heading up into that little rocky outcrop, thanks to VM's forecast. Who knows how much longer these buffalo will feel it necessary to keep following her. They will probably lose interest fairly soon as soon as she heads into those thickets. <laughs> She's trying to be a tough girl by plunking herself down right in broad sight of them. And that's probably not a clever move. She should just try and disappear and then they'll stop following her which I think she's eventually going to do. Jeez, they're impressive buffalo bulls, those. Well, the other lioness, I'm not sure if you can see her, VM. She was, I think, straight in front of us. I can't see her. We're a bit, I'm a bit low here. Is she behind? Oh, there she is. So here's the second lioness. And she, too, will probably join the first one that's headed up into those thickets. Maybe go back up to the... Up to that top one, the buffalo approaching again, wildebeest, sorry. Fuzzman, you enjoy seeing the lions being chased by the buffalo, and so do I. It's always good to see the roles reversed, and buffalo are certainly one prey species that can really turn it on against the predators, especially when there's large herds. They can... After the initial shock of the lions possibly ambushing them or scaring them or once they've kind of come to terms with the fact that there's lion in the area, they often regroup after having initially fled the scene and then come in with numbers to chase the lions away. Very, very good. All right, well, we are going to move on from here and see what else we can find, start heading back towards home. We are quite hungry and looking forward to breakfast. Um, and Taylor, it sounds like she's got herself into a large herd of wildebeest, so why don't you go and see what's happening there? I feel like I've just been swimming in wildebeest today. I haven't got myself out of a herd of wildebeest. It's been fairly pleasant, but we're bumbling along now. We just came to check on the spot where I saw uh, that male lion man who also saw him yesterday. Um, quite a nice looking fella along this main stretch of road, but unfortunately he's moved off. I don't know where he's gone to. And then we also got wind that apparently there's another pride of lions on the riverine thicket somewhere, the forest uh, uh, down to the east of us. Uh, some some guests saw it from a hot air balloon. How nice is that? And um, so we probably Probably we'll go follow up on that a little bit later but we're just sitting here we're admiring the scenery again just checking out for those single lines that have been seen around this area obviously that lioness that James had we try to follow up on her no sign of her just yet and um, so so it's not too much happening just yet. it's the wildebeest are making so much noise but I have something to show you Manu I have to show the viewers on your character they're gonna be so excited who's ready to meet Maurice <laughs> 
<laughs> I haven't showed you yet. This is Mo Reese. This is my gift from, well, most of the team up here in in Kenya, which was really cool, Mara team, so thank you very much. Mo Reese now comes on safari with me every single day. It's an elephant. Well, your scarf is over your tusk. So I also just want to take this moment because I haven't said thank you. Thank you, everybody, for all the wishes. It's been a very busy last few days, but it was wonderful. And it sounds like I'm getting my suitcase back as well. Woo! Win all around. I'm so excited. But yes, Maurice, elephants, very cool. This might be the closest elephant that we get to. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's been really, really lovely out here. I'm definitely settling in. It's starting to feel just like a home. Oh my goodness, and it seems as though Byron is sticking to his old uh, sort of routine. He's got his flask out, uh, he's having a cup of coffee. Let's go across to him and see how many birds he's now got on his list. I am indeed having my coffee, and uh, now let's have a look. A, a bunch of birds just took off, and there was a bit of a bird party. We've got rattling cesticulars. Um, Let's have a look here. I think, yeah, we do have rattling cesticulars. Uh, still in 76. No new birds this morning. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Wendy. I'll put the clutch in before I change gears. Come on, Sense. What are these little guys? Lots of little birds. Flying. This little bird here. What is that? Uh, can't even see what that is. To be honest, uh, uh, there, wait, there it is, jumping around. Is that not a? I can't see it. Can you see it? Sorry, I'm trying to let me move out the way. See if you can get it there, Senza. I can't see it. There was a little bird. I think it was maybe just a cesticular that that jumped around there. I think that's what it was, Senza. Once a bird's disappear into this um, scrub, then it's it's almost impossible to see them. All right, well, let's um, oh, it's okay, since I think it was a cesticular, Jeffrey. Um, you were asking if uh, if a shrike can be considered a bird of prey. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. And the reason I say that is because the, the birds of prey generally have big talons and they hunt regularly. But the birds, oh, look, there's a herd of wildebeest. It's our own migration. There they go. They are running. I don't know what they're doing, they're just chasing one another. So Jeffrey, as I was saying, the, the shrikes though, they, they hunt insects, so they're insectivores, mainly insectivores. Yeah, they will possibly um, catch other, other, um, oh, mate, sometimes little rodents and lizards and that, but, but I don't think they're considered a bird of prey. Bird of prey, eagles, falcons. Oh, Senza, I have got a bird that we don't have yet. It's the one I wanted to get. You see those those thin sticks that are sticking up where this little bush is? Yeah. Just have a look at the top there, see if it's still there. Um, no, that's this um, flycatcher. Is it? No, that's a southern black tit. Hang on, no, 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 wait, uh, let me see. Oh. It's 
Sorry, Senzo, that, that's a fork-tailed drongo that you've got sitting over there um, that you caught a glimpse of. Let's just see. It was a long-billed crombeck, a tiny little long-billed crombeck. <sighs> oh, don't worry, they're gone. I don't think so. I don't think I've got a long-billed crombeck, though, do I? Do I? Okay. Okay, we've got, apparently we've got that on the list. Oh, it's so frustrating though, trying to see these birds and they just disappear. Like I said, our list would be much higher if it was just the birds that I saw. Because I, it's a lot quicker for me just to look with binoculars, get a glimpse of it and as it flies away. Sorry, I just want to find out something quickly. Mike, Mike for Byron. Uh, Mike, did you have any luck with that lioness? Okay, copy. You should see the quarry branch that I dropped. I just want to find out if that lioness is still in that area. So I told someone where to go and have a look. But you see, I'm so kind. I put a branch in the road so it's easy for them to then know where we had her last. Huh? Huh? Far too kind, I think. Should maybe make some of these up. Anyway. <laughs> Jenny, you asked, how does the Marshall Eagle compare in size to the to the uh, Bald Eagle? Um, uh, Jenny, I'm not I'm not sure. How tall is a Bald Eagle? Maybe um, maybe our dear friend um, Megan can tell me. Megan, how tall is a Bald Eagle? Centimeters, please. And and I will tell you the Marshall, because the Marshall Eagle is very big, Jenny. Um, she was fine when I was following her. I think it's the lioness from the Nkuma Pride that has got the new cubs at the moment. You can see she is lactating. Um, I think it's that female. She's just looking for the rest of the pride. Sorry, I'm... <laughs> Megan, thank you. you Megan says about... <laughs> Megan said about 35 inches. So I've got no idea what that means. But she then said about 88 centimeters. So that's slightly bigger than a Marshall Eagle. A Marshall Eagle is about 81 centimeters, about 81 centimeters. Um, so how big is that? Let's see. Senzo, uh, if I was here, sorry, my nose is itchy. 30, about, third, that's 30, eh? 60, uh, about, about there, I would say. If this eagle is sitting next to me. It's massive. It's a big eagle. And a bald eagle, a bit bigger. A bit bigger than that. <sighs> massive. Those are huge birds of prey. Alright, so that lioness um, was still there. So I think we, we made the right call by leaving her. Um, but hopefully she finds the rest of the pride at some point. Now let's head back across to Scott and find out how his journey back towards camp is going. Yes, we have the zebras in a line and two some wildebeest. I'm not sure if that was the correct English and two some wildebeest. Forgive me. <laughs> 
but an awesome, awesome scene. And look at all those wildebeest dotted in the background beyond them. Absolutely fascinating the numbers of these animals and also fascinating their movements. I'm always astounded by the fact that they sometimes are heading north and sometimes heading south. And who knows how exactly they determine where to go and when. They could be heading to a watering point now. There's a spot where especially the zebra like to drink not far behind us. And maybe the wildebeest are just tagging along for the ride. Beautiful. What's also fascinating is that you can drive through an area on one day and find nothing in it, and then the next day just be completely filled up and teeming with animals. So there's a large amount of movement between these animals over quite large areas in short spaces of time, which keeps us on our toes. Of course, we like to try and position ourselves in and amongst as many of the migrating herds as possible. Well, what got these zebra going? I'm looking around, I'm not seeing anything that would warrant them being frightened of, so possibly it's just some joyful, joyful running around. Janine, you would like to know if there is an adrenaline rush when the animals are hunting amongst us guides and the cameramen and all guides, and yes, certainly. I mean, the feeling of anticipation and excitement for the predators or for the prey, depending on whose team you are on, both of which, I guess, need support from, from us. But yeah, there's definitely a high amount of adrenaline and excitement whenever there's a p potential hunt on the cards. Uh, I know that's certainly the case for me and most other guides. I find it hard to believe that there will not be an increased heart rate when there are these exciting times. And what's important to remember is that, you know, most guides spend hours and hours out and very seldom see actual hunts unfolding. So it's naturally very exciting because it's something that's rare for us to see. Even in the migration here where we've been spoiled with a surplus of hunts and kills and takedowns and, and incredible action, even still it's something that I don't think any of us will ever get used to, regardless of how often we do get lucky. So, yeah. What would be quite nice would be to have a heart rate monitor attached to us for those exciting moments that would show up on the screen. Maybe that's some tech that we can add to our already fairly elaborate list of technical toys that we have on these vehicles. But that certainly would provide you guys and us with some interesting insights in, as to how excited we all get in these situations. Good, we're gonna pop you across to Taylor, who I'm told is in a similar scenario to me regarding her surroundings and the animals in which are around her. Toodle do. We do, we've just got a couple of vehicles that have popped into the sighting now, but there's a massive group of wildebeest and zebra, and it was really incredible last night. Obviously, I'm still coming to terms with everything, but as we were driving home quite late, it was sort of spotting the spotlight. And it's amazing how everything goes to the hills, the escarpment rests, and then comes back out into the open. So that's what these wildebeest are doing now. And the zebra is they've rested, they're waking up, and now they're moving out, moving out into the open where they will graze. They'll probably go and drink some water at some point too. We've even got a zebra having a roll. Wasn't that nice? not too dusty over there. We know how important it is for these animals to roll around in dust. Uh, they can't just apply a, a medicine to get rid of the ticks, of course, so by rolling in the dust it helps suffocate all those parasites. Aren't they awesome? I, I really, I'm, I'm in so much awe at the moment. It's, it really is it's an overwhelming experience being here and seeing so many animals. I've never seen this many animals before. There definitely weren't this many in Zambia. But how great is this? Let's go up a little bit further forward. I just want to reposition us just slightly. And get another view. See now, again, the momentum is gaining. 
and once one lot decides to cross then they all do we're gonna have another rolling zebra i think this one looks like it's looking for the perfect spot you see it's sort of that sort of uh that movement there we go you're careful of the rocks you don't want you to hit your head on a rock nice little spot here oh there we go now when i was riding horses and when i had horses it was always a very good sign if your horse was able to roll completely um over like that it meant that it didn't have a sore back so the zebra is obviously in good nick and now look at that now that one or two of them have started rolling the rest of the herd want to join in that is so typical uh, of animals in the equius family and now they're all going to have a roll there and off you go. Ooh, beautiful coloration on this one. Ooh, yeah, there we go. You going to go back and do it again? Kick in the air. Zebra always seem to be so graceful the way that they roll. When a wildebeest does it, it's not as impressive. But these don't look like adults. These look like youngsters. Off we go. A couple of... Oh, yeah, all the little ones are sort of grouped together. Another one, next one coming in. My turn. Have a spot, have a chance to roll in the dust. No, not too impressed with the smell of that, giving a snort and dismay. You can see the, how uh, the younger zebra, look how light in colour they still are, look how fluffy they are. That's also very important to keep those, uh, those youngsters nice and warm through the chilly night. So it's definitely not as cold as Juma. I have yet to put gloves on. I haven't even worn a big jacket just yet, although yesterday morning was a little bit nippy. But otherwise, it's quite nice. I just want to move out of the way quickly for this other car i'm just gonna oh, oh no they, never mind they actually they're being quite nice they're able to squeeze past i'll just give them a bit more room let me just do this wave be friendly of course we're still friendly as south africans all right let's have a quick look here hi zebbies there was a whole lot of cars that stopped up, and I don't know what they, they've all gone now. I wonder if they also just weren't watching the wildebeest and the zebras coming down from the hills. I'm just quickly scanning. This is the area where James had that lioness yesterday. Maybe let's go check. I don't know what intrigued everybody so much. Everyone has now moved on. But you just never know. What could have also happened is maybe there was something and it actually moved off into this thicket. This would be a very good spot for a leopard. It's so nice and thick around here. Lots We'll eventually start talking about all the nice vegetation as we go about as well. Lots of matumi trees by the looks of it. I think they, they look like matumi trees. No, I don't see any lions. No, maybe it was just another impressive sort of crossing of the wildebeest coming uh, through and uh, heading out into the open plains but i'm going to send you back across to byron now he's just bumbling along in juma but you never know what you'll see next well i went past the hyena den just to have a look but no sign of any activity there i haven't had any luck with that hyena den since i've been back i haven't seen any hyena cubs or adults there but we'll, we'll keep checking every now and then. But yeah, no sign of anything there at the moment. Hey, why you said how long has it been since we've seen a giraffe? Um, oh, it's been a while, I think. Maybe four or five days, I think, somewhere around there. Can't remember now, actually. Starting to warm up quite nicely now. And Wada, you asked if I'm afraid of getting lost in between the thickets when we go off-roading. Uh, no, no. Uh, these. This area, it's it's quite easy to navigate through, or especially once you get used to used to an area. Um, but uh, like this area, it's, it's it's fairly small, so chances. I mean, no, it's no. <laughs> Eduardo, I don't think so. I don't think you could get lost. Um, like I said, obviously spending more time in the bush and more experience it does help. But um, but yeah, 
the the road network and that you just have to pick a direction and head that way and eventually you would hit the road it's uh, it's very difficult to get lost yeah maybe if you knew um, oh, we've got those those are the red-breasted swallows we've seen them Gee, it's been so hard to find a new bird this morning. See, I told you, once we start hitting these high 70s and 80s, it's going to be very difficult to get new species. I was hoping to get to 80 this morning, but let's sit here for a second. Let's just see if something flies past. I can hear rattling cesticulars. I saw some quillias fly past. We still need one or two woodpeckers. Um, we've got the bearded woodpecker. It would be nice to see the golden tailed and the cardinal. Um, I, I hear the golden tailed often, but just haven't been able to see one. Also, with a bit of this wind, it's not ideal. It's not that windy, but it is. It is there's a, a breeze blowing. There's a woodpecker holding it. It's just through that little gap there. Can you see it? Yeah, it looked like a small one. Oh dear. Looks like a youngster. Can you see it there? Yeah. Oh, but which young one? Sometimes these woodpeckers give me more grey hairs. More grey hairs than anything else. Now, is that not a... Where did it go? I'm trying to use my binoculars. It's a bit easier than to to see but please send screenshots where did it go now still dancing around there since can you still see it they are there oh, it's directly behind a branch now you see but it is a young one it doesn't really have that red can't see the red on the head Hear a squirrel alarm calling in the distance. Um, I think this might be a um, a little cardinal, a young cardinal. I think so, everyone. Which is what I thought initially. Yep, that's a young cardinal woodpecker. That is great. We were speaking about it. about seeing these um, these little birds and I'll show you why I say that well 77 for us uh, that's great a new one it is definitely a cardinal woodpecker a young card or female female cardinal woodpecker young youngish female um anyway let's head across to james i'm sure he is as excited as i am about the new bird to our list and he is watching the river across the dusty crossing come on rebecca hurry up let's go to dusty crossing well done <laughs> i'm going to get punched in the face everybody after this drive <laughs> Apparently not in the face, but in the throat. Oh, I see there are some punters just having a little walk on the banks. Right, that's not very good. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's avoid them. Uh, when one of them gets pushed into the river by a buffalo, I guess we'll all be able to sit here and say, well, we told you so, didn't we? 
Here we have another pod of Hippopotami, my favourite crossing, this one, or my favourite river view, this one in the evenings. And not much in the way. Oh, is that a. Just trying to see if we're looking at a carcass there. I don't think we are. No, we aren't. But there are so many carcasses, and let's go. We can go back to cul de sac now, if you like. Yes, we can, Rebecca. There we go. Don't get ornery with me on the telephone. Not the telephone. What's this thing you're talking to me on? The radio. Yes, the radio. That's it. Oh, we've got a bird walking on a hippopotamus. Let's have a look what it is. It is a sandpiper walking on a hippo. <laughs> that is very cool. That looks like a common sandpiper to me. I wonder what it thinks it's going to find there. Look at that. It's pecking little bits and pieces out of the hippo's skin. That's fantastic. Let's see if he pops out the other side there. And the hippo doesn't seem to mind in the slightest. How wonderful. All right, well, let's go out from there. I've never seen that before. And you certainly can learn all sorts of new things from watching the rivers on a daily basis. And now, can we get back to Dusty Crossing, please, Rebecca? There's action happening, huge action there. There's a crocodile coming out of the river. <gasps> Ooh. Lucky those people aren't standing this side. That is an enormously, enormously fat reptile. Look at him lurking there behind the bank waiting for something to step on him thinking that he was just a stepping stone he does rebecca says he looks like a balloon with spikes on it i think that that is quite true he does look a bit ballooning and he seems to realize that we're looking at him from the camera you see he's hidden himself behind this little tuft of grass unfortunately his brain is so small that he's unable to compute the fact that because he can't see us we can't see him. He's a little bit like a two-year-old that hides its eyes and then thinks it cannot be seen. Anyway, that's all right. He doesn't need to know how to hide himself too well from cameras. Let's just see if there's anything else coming down towards the river. Which may have inspired the crocodile to adopt his current position. Alternatively, it was the sight of human beings walking. Freeze. Oh dear. Oh dear. Fro no, we're okay. It's apparently because I was sassy, according to Rebecca, that it froze. Rebecca, of course, clearly doesn't understand technology if she thinks that my sass is going to freeze the internet. All right, let's go back to cool sack now. We've got hippopotamus up and about. Rebecca, you're getting really quick. <laughs> oh, I wonder they can see what they can see here. Hang on. There seems to be some, uh, well, some action, some movement in the water, some ripples. They wouldn't be worried about the buffalo, but they could easily be worried about a lion. And the parrot, oh no, it's not a lion. In fact, let me show you what they're worried about. It would appear to be some more punters. Get back in your car, you cretin. All right, let's go back to Taylor with a hornless, hornless wildebeest. So we obviously have a joke, and most of you know from watching, down in South Africa, we talk about one horn shorn, uh, I've told you the story about the buffalo, but then one horn shorn turned into an impala ram that hung around on Philemon's cut line quite a bit. We saw him for quite a few days, of, of most weeks in fact. However, this uh, wildebeest is sporting a new trend and has gone, horns are so 2016, and has got none. Now, it, it did look like a bull had a quick... Um, sort of scars that he has fought for many, many females in his life and has now unfortunately lost 
both of them. Now, that can't be too good. That must be very difficult. I can't imagine he would be mating with very many females anymore, especially trying to compete with a wildebeest that has not even just one horn, but two horns. So a little bit sad for him. But he's an old boy. I think that's quite nice, in fact. Isn't that interesting? I must tell you as well, guess what? I saw a chameleon last night. I'm going to go back today and look for the chameleon in the in the tree. It was around camp to take a picture so I can find out what species of chameleon it is. It looked fairly similar to a flapneck chameleon, but I haven't got a clue as to the species that you get around here. But it has been a pleasure this morning, don't you think? Filled with lots of lion action. Also, hyenas were on form with Scott earlier on. And I hope that you have enjoyed all of this just as much as we have out here. And we're going to, well, I'm going to continue exploring and finding all the wonderful things. But keep an eye out. You never know what might ha ha happen on the damn cams today. So keep an eye out for those Facebook lives. But from all of us here from the whole Wild Earth team, thank you for everything. And we'll see you for the Sunset Safari.